Good morning, Mr. Cooper. Good morning, sir. Welcome back. Yes, sir. Um, you remain under oath. You took an oath yesterday to answer truthfully. That oath still applies to you, and we're turning now to a cross-examination. Thank you for being back. Absolutely. Good morning, Good morning Ms. Foster. Good morning. We're going to talk about the story that you told here yesterday. Mm -hmm. So... Let's try to just get some clarification. So you pledged rat, rat chapter, correct? Correct. You didn't pledge on rat. Um, tell me a little bit. Uh, do you know what hazing means? I do. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, hazing is unauthorized uh, rituals or or actions that's that's not deemed um, or sanctioned by the fraternity or sorority or the organization because it can go outside of fraternity or sorority. Generally, it is a, you know, a spectrum of hazing, you could say. So hazing, it can go from organization to organization. So what may be hazing in my organization or anyone's organization may be different. Let's talk about your, your cue, right? This is true. Um, how does hazing typically start? Uh, can you be more specific in what setting? And before we go further, I'm confused. Um, uh, so our record is clear. Um, you are a member of Omega Sci-Fi. Yes, sir. AKA the Q's. Oh, yeah. also, they also known as the Q's. The Q's. What's the origin of Q? Because there's no Q in Omega Sci-Fi. Uh, it's just a thing, you know. Just a thing. Yes, the Q, sir. like the letter Q or Q's like Q balls, C U E. Q U E. Q U E. Yes, sir. Okay. The Q's. And that's that's the same. Um, maybe it's more familiar, but that's the same as saying, hey, I'm an Omega or Omega Sci Fi. It's the Q's. Yes, sir. It's an informal way. Informal. Okay. Also, it's not an insult. No, sir. Okay. Also, like the another. Uh, okay. I did hear both of you say that. Yes, sir. With a Z. With okay. A Z. Absolutely. You're learning a lot, Jess. Yes. I am. <laughs> okay, so um, let's talk about the Bros of Cues. Mm -hmm. um, a neophyte wouldn't hate a profile, correct? At what stage before they're neophytes or initiates? So typically, before you haze, uh, a profile will call the neophytes to, to come perform, correct? Ms. Foster, I am being asked by Ms. Rivers to have you be at a microphone. So um, podium, desk, whatever works for you, but she's having trouble picking up your voice. Sorry about that. Okay. And because of your foot, if you would prefer to be seated, that's not an issue. There is a microphone that works just fine at the desk. So if this goes on and, and you're starting to be distracted by your foot, um, it's not going to bother me for you to conduct any part of the exam from, from there. Thank you, Your Honor. Sure. To your question, uh, I mean, Omega, Omega formally is it's a non hazing, non pleasant organization. So I, I've never said anything about hazing. I know you have to say that, but let's keep it real, okay? That is so real. how does hazing typically start? Does it, you is it true that someone that's of a, a higher stature would call a newer person, someone either trying to join or neo, to the table to answer to them, correct? Sure. Okay. So let's talk about what happened when you got to the party. Mm -hmm. You got there and your testimony... And Besides your testimony yesterday, you've also given your statement to the state, correct? Correct. In fact, you were interviewed by uh, ADA Costello and Investigator Hall a while ago, correct? Correct. Okay. And you would agree that your statements that you gave to them a while ago is more, was your memory was more fresh at that time than it probably is now, correct? That's possible, but... Okay. Okay. So... When you got to the party, you, and as you testified yesterday, you wanted to meet all the neophytes, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, 
you didn't know everybody at the party, correct? Correct. Okay. And your testimony was that you wanted to introduce yourself, meet these people because you didn't know them, correct? Correct. You didn't know Mr. Thomas either. Correct. Okay. You also didn't know Bruce Richardson, correct? correct. And there were other bros there that you didn't know, correct? Correct. So why didn't you call all the bros to come before you for you to talk to them? Why was it just the Neos? Well, that's a weird question. Um, the neophytes, normally the new initiates, they're scattered, they're doing things, they're running around, like they're not, they're still getting used to this environment of Omega, right? So generally they may stick closer to their chapter brothers. Or they may just be away until, hey, I know you exist. It's okay. Let's 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 talk. If I see a a, a seasoned brother, you know he's he he may ask me before I ask him because this is it was generally a chapter thing they had going on. Your testimony yesterday and before is that you had just got there and you want you didn't want to go and introduce yourself to everyone that you didn't know. So you went outside and you called all the neos to come before you because you wanted to get to know them. Correct. Can you say the first part of that again? Because the first part of that, it's not that I didn't want to not meet everyone. No, I wanted to meet the new initiates. Say, hey, let's let's meet at this common place because I didn't know who they were. I didn't have a picture saying, "Hey, you're 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 Neo, you're Neo, you're Neo." So let's just meet at this common place. Mm -hmm. Then that's for context. That's not verbatim. What makes you so important to call all the Neos? outside before you for them to introduce themselves to you doesn't make me important at all i knew they existed and and it wasn't your house no it wasn't your party not at all but you took it upon yourself as you said mm -hmm. you went outside and you said everybody come out here and talk to me let me get to know you right well not in that tone tone matters tone does matter indeed it does but right? so it wasn't i want to interject for one second though because i'm i'm now getting a different view of the scene. So did you show up at a time when um, lots of people were already outside or when you issued a, a call for the NEOs to line up, um, would that have required people to come from indoors and stop what they're doing? I, I'm, I'm trying to get a flavor for, if I had shown up with you, um, would, were there people milling around in the driveway, in the yard, or was everyone indoors? Everyone. If I, more people, most. most people were outside. Okay. If you were inside, you were either getting food or you were in the kitchen. Okay. So when you made your call for the Neos to line up, um, that was more for, hey, folks who are milling around, those of you who are Neos, come on over here, not come from upstairs or the basement where you're playing pool or something. It's folks who were already out there. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a mandatory, it wasn't a, hey, line up before me type of situation. It's more like, hey, let's meet at the water cooler. I'm the water cooler. Okay. Well, Mr. Cooper, that's not true. Mm -hmm. You actually went inside the house, mm -hmm. right? You met one of the, the bras I did. that you knew. He told you that there was a new line. I did. Right? That happened. That's then true. you went outside and gathered. All, you called for all the Neos to come before you. Correct. So they weren't all outside. They were There were some that were inside and there were some that were outside. And you called for everyone to come outside to line up before you, correct? I said gather around. And that's what that's what I had oh, just explained no, to the no, judge. No. Your testimony was that everyone was already outside. Okay. Right? You were inside, mm -hmm. found out about the new the Neos. Mm -hmm. You called the Neos from inside, you went outside and you said everybody gather out in front in front of me and get to know me, correct? Not correct. What's not correct, Mr. Cooper? If you were inside, that's fine. Uh if you were outside, that's fine. I, where my central location was, hey, 2021, come on over here. Let's get to know each other. I didn't say. Everyone inside, come outside. That's that's not what was said. So let's say I'm a Neo mm -hmm. and I said, F you, I don't want to get to know you. What would happen? Okay. That's your testimony today? Yeah, okay. Like okay. So you I, I, say, okay. I, 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 I say it's, it's I mean, let me stop for one second because Ms. Rivers is not here and she's having a few technical difficulties with turning her speaker on. I'm confident she's frustrated with you two right now because both of you. Picking on one of you, both of you have been speaking over each other. So um, Mr. Cooper is giving his answer and he's so wait, that's not true before he's done. Ms. Foster is asking her question and you're answering it part way through. So we're going to have to end this early if we can't have it be question. Pause.
answer. Yes, sir. Because Ms. Rivers is going to start throwing things at me through the screen. Um, so pause, ask your question again, wait till she's done, wait till he's finished before you pounce on him um, because you don't like his answer. He needs to finish that answer, whether you like it or not. And if you're going to challenge it, feel free to do that. It's cross-examination, but he needs to finish it before um, you are either redirecting him to something else or, or, or drawing attention to something. All right. Okay. So next question or same question. Yes. So if, okay, your testimony is that if a Neo, if you would have said, hey, gather around, I want to get to know you. If a Neo would have said, F you, I don't want to get to know you. You're saying that would have been okay. It wouldn't be, it's a multifaceted answer to a question. First of all, it would be rude. All right, that's just rude. Like, come over, let's talk, let's get to know each other. Now, if you don't want to, all right, well, I mean, what else can I do? Like, I can't force him to come talk to me. Well, based on your testimony yesterday, you put people in chokeholds that are rude, right? No. Okay. So um, you tell everyone to come outside and meet with you. I want to get to know you and your testimony today that it wasn't, if someone would have said no, you would have been okay with it. You want us to believe that? Yes. Okay. And then as you're doing that, Phil Thomas then approaches you and said, um, basically, hey, this is not the place for you to do that. Correct? Those are some of the words. Yes, ma'am, that he said. And your testimony is that you don't know when he's what he was talking about when he said this is not the place to do that. I didn't say that. I didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So you the the reason for you for him. So since you know what he was talking about, he probably thought that you were about to haze the neos where there were women and children around. Correct. Incorrect. I can't. I don't know. I didn't. One. I didn't know him. And two. I can't speculate on what he was thinking. Well, you just told me you knew what he was talking about. What did you think he was talking about uh, when he said this was not the time and place for this? No, I had an idea. What, well, let's back up here. I said I didn't know what he was talking about. No, you just said that you had an idea what he was talking about. So what was the I idea? Yeah. One at a time. Yeah. What was the idea that you thought he was talking about? That it would... It would escalate into a nor uh, not normal, but a negative interaction. Like hazing? You say this, but can you quantify what you mean by hazing? Because it is a spectrum of hazing. It is Bruh. Okay, let's keep it real. Right? Sure. So you said you had an idea of what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. So when he said this was not the time and place, and you just said that it could escalate into something that was not pleasant, mm -hmm. right? Like hazing, correct? Incorrect. Okay. And the reason why I say incorrect, because I, I don't know when you say hazing, what are you saying? Like, can you quantify hazing? That's all I'm saying. Well, you don't have to ask me questions. I ask the questions and you answer. Yes, ma'am. Okay? Understood. Understood. So, but, but, but it's correct that Ms. Foster asked the questions. But if you don't understand the question or a question isn't clear to you, you are free to say, you know, I, I, I can't answer it that way or I, I need to better understand something. So it's, it's not quite right that you don't get to say anything in response other than answering it. And Either we need to move away from hazing or you're going to need to be more specific as to what you're thinking about with hazing, because this witness has now said about five times, hazing is so many different things. What do you mean when you say it? And then you simply say, you know what I mean, hazing. And I've now heard that enough times. I don't need to hear it again. I get where both sides are going with this. So, you, OK, you thought that he thought it might escalate to something that was not pleasant. I don't know what he thought, but I gathered the connotation okay. of what he was saying. Okay, so he said wrong place, wrong time. Your testimony is that he, you, he told you wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're at the wrong place, wrong time, you're effed up. That's what, he, that's what you said he said to you, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. So after that interaction, um, he walked away, and you walked away, correct? I walked away first. And when I walked away, I don't know where he where, where he went. When I walked away from the situation, Swain and him were still talking. Okay. Because Swain was right, right there. I walked away. Okay. Okay. So your testimony is that when you were outside and you called everyone to come meet with you, that Swain was there? It was his house. Swain was right there. That's what you're saying. 
No, that's not what I'm saying. So when Phil came up to me and we had an exchange, then then a Swain came up. So Swain wasn't like right there and I joined them. You know, Swain came up after the fact. I know that you had several interactions, right, with Mr. Thomas that night. Mm -hmm. Your testimony yesterday mm -hmm. and the testimony well, that you've given prior is that at some point, Mr. Thomas threw a drink on you, mm -hmm. right? And then after that interaction was at the time that Swain walked up. No, ma'am. We were talking about two periods in time. Okay. You, if if I'm incorrect, please please set me straight. But my understanding is that you and Mr. Thomas had that first interaction. You wanted the neophytes to show up. Mr. Thomas thought that was a bad idea. Um, you were sort of taken aback by the way in which he engaged you. And it was as that was wrapping up, that was the first time Mr. Swain came up because that's when you said to him effectively, like, what's the deal with this guy? Correct. And and Swain said, Don't worry about it. You, you, you're good. Go, you go your way. Correct. And that's, okay. and that's the moment in time that uh, that I think that's what we're talking about. That's right what now. we're talking about. I'm talking about the first interaction. So your testimony today is that after the, the first interaction with you and Mr. Thomas, that was the time that Swain came up. I'm now confused because would seeing your testimony prior refresh your recollection? Not at all. I'm confused on. I, I believe you just jumped time, like jumped occurrences. We were just talking about the very first time that Phil and I interacted. Yes. And then Swain came up. You just asked me, you said Swain was there the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that was his house. But Swain came up, as the judge just said. Swain came up. He told me to go away. And I went away. So there were several interactions. I'm going to. Um, so the first interaction, when you spoke with the state previously, um, after the interaction, um, one moment. After that, so you're saying after that first interaction, Swain also walked up. So in your, you had three, you had three interactions with Phil Thomas. So after each interaction that you have with Phil Thomas, Swain walked up? No. Okay. So in the testimony that you gave to the state before, um, you know, actually, I'll come back to this. So your testimony is that after this, with this unpleasant first interaction with Phil, Swain walked up and said, hey, you know, go on about your business. Nothing's going on. Yes, ma'am. That's okay. the first one. So then as after that, you're going about your business um, and people keep walking up to you. That's what you said. People keep walking up to you, telling you to calm down. Yes, ma'am. And so you're just standing there minding your business, just, you know, just being really calm and people come up to you and say, calm down. Yes. Okay. So. Let me just kind of get in my head what this looks like. So you have a drink in your hand and you're just standing by the corner, minding your business, being a peaceful person that you are. And you're just seeing you just drinking. Someone comes up to you and say, hey, hey, calm down, calm down, calm down. That's what you're saying? Yes, we were enjoying the party. Okay. Enjoying the party, mingling, running around. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so people were telling you to calm down even though you were calm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. In fact, multiple people. So while you were being calm, drinking your drink, multiple people, people came up to you and said, hey, calm down, relax, relax. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then after this happened several times, you then approach Phil Thomas and you tell him to leave your name, leave your name out of his mouth. In so many words. Okay. And then. Um, and it, I'm sorry, may I? Yeah, now, go ahead. I also asked them, like, what's your problem? Okay. You said, I'm tired of people approaching me about something that you said that's not true. And you're saying at that point, he laughed at you and walked away. It was more, yeah, it was a smart, small laugh. And he didn't say anything. Like, that, that wasn't. Okay. So even after that, so you already said multiple people. So at least, I'm going to, multiple people is at least two, right? Sure, we Between the that. first interaction and this second interaction where Phil laughs at you, right? Yes, ma'am. And then even after that, you're still being calm, minding your business, drinking your drink. And people keep coming up to you and say, hey, you need to relax. You're doing too much. Right? Yes, ma'am. And if I, if I can clarify, that was still the same drink. 
Okay, I don't care about the drink. I'm talking about you being relaxed. Yes, ma'am. And minding your business. Mm -hmm. And these random people in the party saying, hey, hey, relax, stop tripping. You're doing too much. Even Mm -hmm. though you weren't doing too much. Correct. So we know at least two people previously between the first interaction and second interaction had told you to calm down. And then after the second interaction, you want us to believe that you were still being so calm, peaceful, minding your business. Yet people kept coming up to you Mm -hmm. saying, hey, let me use your own words. Coop, you're tripping. You need to relax. You're doing too much. While you're minding your business. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then as that continues, um, then one of your profites pulls you to the side and says, hey, you know, we need to talk. And you, you, you found out later that that was an inter- intervention. Right. Uh, yes. In, in so many words, that's the space. Yes. Do you have more than one? D- does a Q have more than one pro fight or you have a, everyone has a pro fight? More than one. More than one. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, more than one. Is, we're just talking about one in particular. I understand we're talking about one in particular. I just I'm trying to learn. And Ms. Foster said one of your pro fights. And I just, I thought from the process that you have a pro fight because this is the person who pledges you or helps you cross the line or whatever it is. But it sounds like there could be a family of pro fights. Absolutely. Okay. And one of them at least was at the party. And we heard about this yesterday. It was intervention time. This is the AC unit and right. jujitsu moment one. Okay. So um, it, they pull you to the side and uh, you, you see Phil uh, walking up with some other people and you realize, hey, this is an intervention, right? Correct. And then your testimony is that you didn't like what Phil was saying. You didn't like how he was talking to you, right? Correct. And then you, and he throws a drink on you. There was some things that happened before then. It wasn't just him talking, then drink thrown. Okay. Um, so your testimony previously is that he's talking, uh, saying words to you and you don't like the words and then, um, you try to walk away, but they're blocking you from walking away. They're being your brothers. And then, um, he throws a drink on you. No, ma'am. I never said anybody, anybody blocked me from walking away. I walked the opposite way and ran into a fence. Would seeing your prior testimony refresh your recollection? No. So it, it's I'm using my hands. Someone to- I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I walked away into a fence, but the only point of the only uh, the only point of ingress were they, that's where Phil they they were on that side. They weren't blocking me like, hey, you can't leave. They were just that's where they were. So I walked away to the point of least resistance. So if you said previously. I tried to walk away, but it's West Atlanta. So we were on the side of the house. The way the backyard was set up, they were blocking my ingress and egress. You don't recall saying that? Yes, and that's exactly what I mean. That's I went to the fence side, right? Because it's, 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 a, rec, it's a small rectangle. So I went to the fence side, right? And they were on the only side that you can walk into that little space. Okay, so the answer to my question is yes. They were blocking your ingress and egress right i think block is a strong word well that's what you said very well okay so then after that you say that phil then throws a drink on you there were still words being exchanged then okay after the words he then throws a drink on you correct okay and then you said that you guys got into a scuffle correct right and then what you testified to is that you've had him in some kind of martial arts uh, headlock. Right? Yes, ma'am. And you testified that you know you have to be careful because sometimes you can block somebody's air off and they can go to sleep and not wake up. Right? That's a positive. That's a possibility. Okay. And okay. you're a trained fighter, right? Not a professional fighter, but yes. Okay. And you had a fight scheduled the next month in June. Yes. Okay. So did you tell Mr. Thomas that as you were choking him out? No. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned on your direct that you whispered in his ear to calm down. And so your testimony today is that you never said, I'm a Marine. I can kill you with my bare hands. 
That's weird to say. I'd never say that. I never say that. Okay. Okay. Um, but okay. But what you testified to is that you can put someone to sleep and sometimes they may not wake up. No, no, not that I can. The point of the move can. The point of, I mean, we're not going to play spades. The point of the move is to incapacitate. Mm, okay. And your testimony yesterday was okay. that there's some times that you can put someone to sleep and they may not wake up. Now, when I say me, I'm not talking about me. The point of the move, and let me expound, is to incapacitate and or subdue. Okay. Two, two things can happen, and, and, that's, and you got you to delineate between the two. Those two things can happen. Very and good. so, yes, I wanted to explain mm -hmm. that my intention was not to do that. And I'm aware of what, you know, I'm aware of the, the capabilities, limitations of what, of what I'm doing. How are you aware of it? You too. Oh, but you're a trained fighter, right? Yeah, yes, ma'am. And as a trained fighter and as someone who was in the Marine and you kept mentioning that you were in the military and you know how to do all these things, but you don't know how to do that. No, no. Oh, I never said. Well, what are all these things that you're talking confused? What are all these things that you're saying I, I said? I'm confused too, sir. I'm just trying to get clarification on what you said. You're asking the questions. Yes, I am. And yes, you're answering. So That's what you said yesterday was that. I'm just going to object argumentative. Well, on both sides. Um, so if he's confused, then ask a different question. Okay. So what you said yesterday, mm -hmm. right, was that um, when you put people in a chokehold, right, you can sometimes put them to sleep and that you didn't want to do that because sometimes you can put people to sleep and they may, may not wake up. What I was explaining was not that I walk every day and put people in chokeholds. I was explaining the capabilities of said chokehold. Okay. What kind of trained fighter are you? Uh, I have a discipline in wrestling, um, a white belt in jiu-jitsu, which is the basic belt of jiu-jitsu. Um, training through the Marine Corps Martial Arts Program, McMap, And uh, I was a kickbox instructor. Instructor? Yes. Okay. All right. The tournament that you had in June, what tournament was that? It was a small time. It was a small time tournament out of uh, Dallas. Small time. Right. Okay. But if you were at would if I had gone to the tournament, would I see people boxing or was it MMA or was it um, cage match and you couldn't go in because it's secret in like fight club or I guess what 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 would I have seen if I went? Well, I did two actually. I entered. I entered two. It was a uh, amateur boxing, as well as a jujitsu tournament. So it it would have been both. Well, not at that time. It was two separate tournaments at one time. In fact, you considered yourself a warrior, right? That's correct. Okay, and um, you didn't want to, you know, choke out an old man because that's not real warrior like, correct? Correct. Okay. So then after that, so again, so now this is the third interaction, because remember, the first interaction was outside when you called all the Neos. The second interaction was when he smiled and walked away, right? And this is the now the third interaction, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then after this third interaction, Swain shows up again, right? In passing, like, he just doesn't, poof, show up. Yes, like. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And then when Swain magically shows up again for the second time after an interaction with Phil, he then tells you, um, you know, that, hey, I spoke with Coop. He, well, he asked you what just happened, right? Yes, he, well, he found out. I don't know how he found out, but he found out. And your testimony, or you testified that he told you that um, Phil was upset because Phil thought that they were picking you over him, correct? Correct. Okay. This is after the third interaction that you had with Mr. Thomas, right? Correct. Okay. And then um, after that, you just, you're still being relaxed, being the cool coop that you are, right? It was a party. We were, okay. yes, ma'am. You were relaxed? They I call you, Go your, ahead. your line brothers call you the live five, right? Correct. What does that mean? It rhymes with five and it's live, but I'm not the only one. You're not the only live five or you're not the only one who's called live? 
Like, is there a live seven, which doesn't rhyme as well, but it's like, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, he, he does, he, 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 exactly. Uh, five is live five. That's, that's, that's a universal thing. Our group me of fives in my whole chapter is called the live fives. It's a thing. Mm, I'm, it's not just, it's not just you. No, you have a group of people called the live fives. Right. Yes, that's the testimony that you're sticking to. Yes, ma'am. And, and that goes across the divine nine okay. that, 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 that doesn't have, it's not exclusive to Omega or myself. What does live mean? It can mean anything. I know boring fives like who are live. Mean? What does it mean to you? Uh, you're exciting. Life of the party. Uh, for me specifically, I was the, uh, what we call the show dog. So I, uh, during, during step shows, I lead the step show. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I do. I'm out front where we're getting in. So, I mean, I'm not, and when you say calm, you use that several, several times. I'm not, I'm not an introvert who sits over in the corner and just sips on, on, on my drink. I'm mingling. I'm happy. Uh, I missed a lot of people. COVID just ended. I just graduated. I'm happy to be home with everybody's just happy to be outside. So. But you would agree that it's not normal for you to be just calm, drinking your drink, having fun, and people to come up to you and say, hey, 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 you're doing too much. Calm down, calm down, right? Exactly. Okay. So, but that's what was happening. That's what you, you want us to believe. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then um, after that third interaction, um, you start changing your clothes in the living room. Correct. Why were you changing your clothes in the living room? No specific reason. That's why our bags were the way the house is set up. Um, the living room is sits back and around the corner away from people. You, know? you weren't showboating, taking off your shirt, trying to be big man. Objection, relevance. No, ma'am. Oh, it's relevant, Your Honor, because it talks about his state of mind, the way that he was acting at the party, the way. Got and he said no. So um, you can move on. Okay. And while you were changing in the living room, there were other people in there. Not in the living room. Well, they were in the kitchen. Again, this is an open concept. The, the, the house is an open concept. So the living room sits in the back. Then you have the dining room right next to it. And then the kitchen, which is where the door is, that, that leads into the backyard where everybody, uh, we're, we're, we're either eating or getting, getting drinks in the kitchen. So we were like in the back. It wasn't even lit. Um, so if you testified previously that the living room had a few brothers in there, but we started changing clothes. Yes. Okay. So I have people in there and this is a house that has a bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. Has a bedroom. Mm -hmm. has so a Mr. Cooper, when you're answering, make sure you say yes, rather than I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Just yes. The reporter needs a yes or a maybe or whatever your answer is. I apologize. Yes, ma'am. So there's a bathroom. There's a um, bedrooms. In fact, you were staying with Swain, so you had a, a bedroom to sleep in, right? The couch was more preferable. My question is, you had a bedroom to sleep in, right? No. Okay. Um, but there were bedrooms in the house, so you could have went and got some privacy, right? Okay. It, I don't know who was in those bedrooms, so I would say no, ma'am. I, I don't I don't know. But you thought that it would be better to change in the living room where bros are hanging out? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then as you're changing clothes, another guy is looking at you real weird, right? Yes, ma'am. That guy's Bruce Richardson. To my knowledge, yes, ma'am. Okay. And so you're in the living room. He's in the living room. You're just randomly, like, I'm in the courthouse. Let me just start taking off my clothes. And you thought it was weird that somebody was looking at you? He was in the dining room. Okay. Which is several feet away. Okay. <laughs> Um, feet or meters, because I, I want to make sure that we're clear. Several this, feet away. This is not a tactical situation, so I can use feet now. Okay. And he's looking at you while you're changing clothes in the in the living room, and you thought that was weird. But how he was looking at me, not just he was looking at me, just, it, it, just how he was looking at me. Yes, ma'am. If I started changing clothes right here, would you think that was weird? It's a courthouse. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you would be looking at me funny too, right? No, I wouldn't be looking at you at all. Okay. But you thought instead of maybe taking your clothes somewhere else, you kind of confronted him, right? Just asked him, like, hi, what's going on? Oh, okay. 
he's looking at you weird and you're like, hey, I'm calm, live five. What's going on? That's that's what you, you have? Well, he, 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 he's looking at me in a, it wasn't a weird way, like perplexion, like what are you, what's he doing? No, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that kind of look. Okay. So you then approach him and you get in a, yet another fight, right? It didn't happen so seamlessly, but okay. there were things in between there. And he's 6'3", and you're 5'11", right? I'm estimating, yes. Okay. And then he gets in a defensive stance. He puts his fist up, right? Correct. After you approach him, right? Can you, can you, can you please expand that? Because it sounds like I'm walking towards him and then he puts his, his hands up and that's not, that's not. For her question was, um, he went into a defensive stance as you approached him and, uh, you can say that's not what happened or you're right or, but the, the question's out there. Um, and I'm not finding it to be a confusing question. So you need to respond to it in whatever way you think is accurate. But um, Ms. Foster doesn't need to switch the question because you don't necessarily like the way it was phrased. Yes, sir. No, no, ma'am. Okay. So if you said previously, um, I walk up to him and you say, what's your name? Relax. It's not that deep. I didn't do any of this. Next thing I know, he squares up on me. I don't know. He's about 6'3". I'm 5'11". He's 6'3", standing up. So I got to look him up. It's not okay. He puts his little fist up and we get in a scuffle. Would that be accurate? We were standing there. Yes. Okay. So you did approach him and he got in a defensive, in defensive stance. Whatever you were doing made him defensive to put his fist up. Correct? Not correct. Okay. And then you get in another scuffle where you choke him out. The second person that you choked out that night, right? Correct. And not once did you ever tell anyone, I'm a Marine. I can kill you with my, my bare hands. That's, that's your testimony. That's my testimony. Okay. But why do you keep putting people in chokeholds? What, what's the point of that? Um, I wasn't going to. Kill them with my bare hands, that's one. Two, I wasn't gonna punch them. That's that that's unacceptable. Uh, and I wanted people to <coughs> leave me alone. You see, you talk about choking, fair, but all of this is is is, a, is is on the defense. This was not on this wasn't offensively executed. Hmm, okay. You would agree that if I'm approaching you, right? What would be the reason for you to put your fist up if I'm approaching you? And that's, and that's what I wanted to clarify. I wasn't approaching him as you just did. I approached him and, because that wasn't, now. That, wasn't, that wasn't very seamless. Okay. Right? But you did approach him. He didn't approach you. Right. I approached him and I put my hand out. Yes, and ma'am. For some reason, mm -hmm. whatever something you were doing made him defensive in a point where he put his fist up. Which I don't know what that was because... And I do want to clarify this. As I approach him, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yes, ma'am. I said, who are you? What's your name? And we exchanged information. And then there was a small conversation there because I was going to his pro fight's birthday party. And so as, long as I tell him, like, relax, just relax. And so we would talk. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. You don't need to stop your answer because she interrupted you in both directions. So finish your answer. Then Ms. Foster will ask her next question. So he, he, he was excited, but this is true. And I'm like, hey, what, what's going on? So I didn't advance on him. And, and then he went to a defensive posture. We were just talking. We were talking. And I'm trying to w figure out, again, what his problem was. And he, as he's reading me this indictment of, of actions that I didn't do, now I'm, de I'm verbally defending myself saying, this isn't, this isn't true. This is not what's going on. And then out of nowhere, he puts his fist up. So there, 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 were, there were things that happened. There, it wasn't so cut and dry of, I walk up, he puts his fist up. That's, that's, that's shallow at best. Let me ask you this. From your perspective as a, a reasonable person, um, if someone were to approach you, what would be the reason that you would put your fist up? 
if they come to attack me. Okay. So if you, as the reasonable person, would put your fist up in a defensive stand, you, if I'm approaching you and you put your fist up, you must believe that I'm coming to attack you, correct? I'm confused. I'm sorry. I'll move on. So after you got into this, and, and I'll ask you this question. You would agree that choking someone could cause someone to die, right? There's a possibility. Okay, so the answer to my question is yes. Yes. Okay. So after your chokehold, your second chokehold of the night, your clothes were ripped, right? Pants. Your pants were ripped. And then um, that made you upset because you couldn't go to the following party, right? It made me upset because they were one of my favorite pants. You testified or you said previously that my clothes were ripped, so I couldn't go to the following party, so I'm irritated. Yes. Okay. Can you, um, Ms. Foster, help me understand, when, when you're saying testify previously, is it what you think Mr. Cooper said yesterday, or do you have a document? I don't have it. I don't need it, but it just helps me context-wise where you're pulling these long strings of uh, things that you, I'm sure, are appropriately attributing to Mr. Cooper. Yes, it's from his um, interview with um, ADA Costello. Okay. And do you have a verbatim transcript or it's a summary prepared by um, the investigator or Mr. Costello? I have a verbatim transcript and I have a video. Okay. I don't need either, but it's actually a transcript of the interview. Yes. I do have right. a copy for you if you want one. Right. If you all want to enter it in evidence, you can't, I don't, I don't need it. It just helps me understand. Um, I, some of the things you have been attributing to Mr. Cooper, I was having trouble remembering from yesterday. And that's not what you're doing. You are attributing his words to him, but they were words spoken in an interview with the district attorney's office sometime before yesterday. Yes, that, Your Honor. All right. I'm following it much better now. Thank you. Okay. And, um, and after you were irritated, uh, you go out the back door and you run into Phil again, correct? Not directly. Okay. But he, he, you, at some point, see Phil in the backyard. He saw me first. Okay. And then there's another altercation, right? I wouldn't call it altercation. There's some jarring back and forth, right? Between? You and Phil Thomas. Correct. Okay. So now this is the fourth interaction, right? Okay. And yes, correct. I'm sorry. I'm not. Okay. Yeah. Verbal. Thank you. And then... After this interaction, your brother, your brothers shuffle you back in the house, right? Correct. Okay. And you don't want to leave. That's what you said yesterday, right? right. Okay. And you're upset that you have to leave, that they're telling you to leave. Well, to provide context, you, 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 short answer, yes. Because this entire night, as you said, I'm calm. I'm 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 a party going. I'm I'm enjoying I'm enjoying myself. Just every everything that I was doing that night was not out of the ordinary as far as my interactions with 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 neos, pro fights, anybody, women, children. It wasn't out of the ordinary. So for people to continuously come up and say, "Calm down," you know feel this, feel that. First of all, I didn't know him. Two, I didn't have a problem with him. So there was no calm down about. So yes, uh, going back to what you had said, it, it was weird. It is weird. And now we've escalated to this point to where it's not that I didn't want to leave because I'm getting kicked out. I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave this situation unresolved. Let's address something that you said. It is out of the ordinary for you to choke people, two people out at a party, right? I mean, no one shows up to a party wanting to do that. But if I had to defend myself, I will. But in both instances, the individuals that you approached got on the defensive. No, ma'am. Okay. It's also not ordinary for you to change clothes in a living room, correct? With people standing around, right? That's ordinary. It's 
It's, it not, it's not out of the ordinary. I never said that it, it wasn't out of the ordinary. You said you weren't doing anything out of the ordinary that night. Right. This, this, it, this, this, don't, this. don't interrupt him. Well, I think I, I was finishing my question that he interrupted me, but go okay, ahead. Don't interrupt her. I, I heard Sorry. it differently, but both of you just Understood. wait till you're done. Understood. Go ahead. It wasn't, it wasn't weird. We were changing clothes to your, to your point, changing clothes in the living room. If you get change your clothes, on it's not things that you were doing that night, calling people outside to meet you, choking people out, changing your clothes in the living room. That's not ordinary. I don't agree with any of that. Okay. So after you then say that you don't want to leave, um, your brothers and people are trying to tell you to, to leave and you're upset. Um, and then at some point they push you into a car. Correct. Okay. And um, you said yesterday that uh, you wanted to talk to him because it's not safe for you to have a problem with someone in Atlanta and you don't work it out. I don't know who it is. Okay. I don't know them. I don't know who it is. Mr. Thomas doesn't know you, right? Correct. So if he doesn't feel safe, if you're approaching him, that makes sense to you, right? No. You just said, and you've testified yesterday mm -hmm. and previously that it was not safe mm -hmm. for you to have a problem with this guy and you don't know him, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So Sorry. it's not safe for Mr. Thomas to have a problem with you and he doesn't know you. I disagree. Your Honor, I'm using his words. If he I, I, I'm all right with it, but but there's a limit. I, I'm your jury, and, and so I'm getting your point. Okay. He is not Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas is not Mr. Cooper. Okay. I've been able to hear from both. Okay. So because you felt that it was not safe, you thought that it was ordinary to the truck or trying to push you in and hold you back. Towards him? For the situation, yes, that would be ordinary. In fact, your words were, you were hauling ass. Correct. What does hauling ass mean? I was moving at a high rate of speed. I was running. I was running. Very fast. As fast as my little legs could. Okay. And this is someone that you don't know, doesn't know you. You had had four altercations with him, one with someone else, right? Correct. And out of those five altercations, you choked two people out. Defensively. Okay. Yet you are hauling ass toward this person that you had had four unpleasant interactions with. Correct. Okay. And as you're hauling ass, people are trying to stop you. No, ma'am. That's the reason why I was running. Okay. You said... You said previously, I'm moving. I'm hauling ass to get around there because people were in my way. And eventually I see I'm about 15 feet from him. When you say people were in my way, what do you mean? They were, they, it was a crowd. Okay. They weren't there for me and my enjoyment. They, it was a crowd. And I assumed if I just casually walked up normally, then I would start to get tugged on as pre as, as it happened before. So I had to get around these people. Okay. So let who me were just there. Okay. Let me use your words from yesterday. Um, one second. Yes. You said that people were trying to push you in the car and you broke free and ran. No, ma'am. That's not what you said yesterday? No, no. Okay. And then you also said yesterday that as you get closer on him, you see that he is in a defensive posture. 
right? Correct. Just like Bruce Richardson was, right? There are levels to it. Okay. It's something about you that puts people on the defensive, huh? Is that a question? Yes. I don't know. I can't tell you what they what they're thinking. Okay. And he's in a defensive posture. And then you see that he has a gun, right? As you're running. No, ma'am. Okay. When did you see that he had a gun? When he shot me. Okay. So if you test or if you said previously, I tried to stop, but it was too late. I got about six, seven feet from him. He pulled it out and he just shot the weapon. Four to six meters. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, before you said four to six feet. So is it feet or is it meters? It's big meters. Meters? Four meters. Four meters. We're looking at about 12 feet. So it's a range, but it's about right. So if you said previously, I got about six, seven feet from him. Mm -hmm. Were you not being honest then? I was never dishonest. Okay. So would hearing what you said refresh your recollection? No, ma'am. It, 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 it would not refresh my recollection because it's, it's still all the same. I was, a, I was a distance. Tell me the difference between six feet and six meters. Six feet, six meters. Which conversion would you like? Tell me the difference between six feet. So I know the difference. Let's move on. Oh, I don't, but I'll move okay. on. Your Honor. Six meters is 18 feet. Six feet is six feet. So one is three times the distance of the other, give or take. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Okay. And you would agree that as you were, actually, I'll move on from that question. And that fifth interaction, I'm sorry, you would agree that the time that you were shot was the fifth interaction that you had with Mr. Thomas that night? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that was after he was in a defensive posture as you were hauling ass towards him, correct? Well, about time. Can I, can I explain? You can okay. explain any answer you want. Okay. So as I went around Swain, because he was in front of Swain, a distance away they weren't right right here uh nose to nose talking they were a distance away um so i went once i got once i went around swain another i'm estimating maybe another meter literally just one that's when i see that's when i see him standing there and i assumed i didn't know what he had behind his back I had no idea what he had behind his back. Mm -hmm. I just saw that it's odd for somebody to stand there with, with their right hand behind their back. I mean, like, that's just, that's just weird. And so when I say a defensive posture, it would be different from say a Bruce who had his fist up. So the assumption, the natural assumption, if someone is standing there with, with uh, their assumed dominant hand behind their back is they have a projectile. No one stands there with the knife. How do you know what's his dominant hand? It's an, that's an assumed dominant hand. And now that Judge McBurney has explained to me what the 18 feet is, six meters. So you're saying that Swain and Mr. Thomas were standing 18 feet away having a conversation? About, and that's why I gave a range. Uh, okay. the, it, again, they were not close. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Any redirect? Very briefly, Judge. Mr. Cooper, um, you testified on cross about an interview that you and I had uh, prior to today's hearing uh, that was recorded, was sent in discovery. That was in September of 2022? Yes, sir. So that was about a year and a half after the incident date? Correct. Yes, sir. Are you left-handed or right-handed? I'm right-handed. 
I have nothing further, Judge. Really quickly. Well, you know what? I don't. No further questions. Okay. You said you're right-handed? Yes, sir. And nothing else, Ms. Foster? No. All right. Mr. Cooper, you can step down. Yes, sir. So um, my thought is that we go till 11. We have to stop at 11, not for the day, but um, I got to go deal with something else at 11. Um, and, and so we might as well, rather than take a break now, um, just get an early lunch. Um, Ms. Rivers, are you good if we um, press on till 11? Jeff Barnett, first name S-H-E-R-A-N-E. Last name Barnett, B-A-R-N-E-T-T. -T. Now you can sit down, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Officer Barnett. Thank you for being here. Uh, officer, where are you currently employed? Uh, City of Atlanta, Zone 1. And is that for the police department? Yes, sir. How long have you been with the Atlanta Police Department? Uh, four years, three years to warm. And what is your uh, duties in your current position with the Atlanta Police Department? I am a patrol officer. Answer 911 calls. And were you employed in this position in May of 2021? Yes, sir. And you're post certified? Yes, sir. And you have been throughout your career? Yes, sir. I want to draw your attention to the early morning hours of May 16th of 2021. Uh, do you recall responding to a person shot call? Yes, sir. Is that at 688 South Elizabeth Place Northwest? Yes, sir. Is that in Fulton County? Yes, sir. Can you tell the court what you observed when you arrived on this scene? Yes, sir. When I observed, when I arrived on the scene, I observed uh, people standing outside. Um, I also observed that the two victims and suspect was not on scene. Um, I then located one shell casing and blood at the crime scene. And uh, throughout your initial investigation of this scene, did you learn that the victims were transported to Grady Hospital? Yes, sir. But they weren't transported by an ambulance? No, sir. And did you respond to Grady Hospital? Yes, sir. As an Atlanta police officer, are you equipped with a body-worn camera? Yes, sir. And uh, are your fellow officers also given body-worn cameras? Yes, sir. And those are to record police citizen encounters? Yes, sir. And did you have your body camera up and running while you were at Grady Hospital? Yes, sir. And Grady Hospital is at 80 Jesse Hill Jr. Drive? Yes, sir. And was Officer Vickers from the Atlanta Police Department also present? Yes, sir. And uh, having shown defense counsel states exhibit two, showing the witness up to mark states exhibit two, uh, Officer Barnett, do you recognize this disc? Yes, sir. What is on that disc? It's going to be uh, Officer Baker's body worn camera footage. And on this body worn camera footage, is there a statement that is recorded by the defendant in this case, Mr. Phil Thomas? Yes, sir. And are you present with Officer Vickers for the entirety of that statement? And is what's on this disc a fair and accurate recording of what the defendant said on May 16th, 2021? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to tender exhibit two in evidence. All right. Before we work through that, Officer Vickers is a colleague of yours, also a zone one patrol officer? He was, yes, sir. Were you and he partners that night such that you both went to the Elizabeth Drive address? He assisted me on the call, yes, sir. Okay. He had a separate car, showed up also? Yes, sir. And then you both went to Grady? Yes, sir. All right. Um, was your camera broken? No, sir. This is just footage from Vickers. And, and Judge, uh, to be honest with you, it's the state's position that um, Vickers' body camera has better audio, which is why we're playing Vickers' body camera. Okay. Um, is the disc all of the body camera so that really officer Barnett's not in a position to lay the foundation for things beyond the interview with Mr. Thomas. And so we need to work through that or, um, and you're only admitting it for, and you'll tell me what the minute start and end points are. Yes, judge. Uh, 
It is not the state's position that Officer Barnett can authenticate every single thing on this disc. It's a 75 plus minute recording. However, uh, Officer Barnett was present for the statement the defendant made to both Officer Barnett and Officer Vickers between the times of 42 minutes and 49 minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, the state is seeking to admit this seven minute, 45 second piece of the defendant's statement for impeachment purposes. There may be on this disc some interaction with Mr. Maddox. No. No. Not that I know of. Oh. So I'm, I'm totally objecting to the fact that um, this video, this body cam comes in through Vickers. Um, Your Honor, uh, Officer Barnett has her own body cam, and I submit to you that it is very, you can hear it. Um, you can hear everything that's being said. Um, I think that the better way to have given, gotten this body cam footage um, successfully authenticated would have been Mr. or Officer Vickers coming to testify and admitting his body cam, and then we can play the body cam or the portion of the body cam where um, Officer Barnett is physically present, and then she can authenticate herself. Um, but as far as allowing this whole body cam of a separate officer who came in a separate vehicle who had a separate body cam when Officer Barnett had her own body cam um, is improper. Okay. Um, and they can hear her body cam. So my understanding is the, the, the argument is that Officer Vickers' body cam is more audible, which is not necessarily true. Officer Vickers, have you viewed the seven minute and 45 second segment from Vickers' camera? I've viewed some. Some, meaning, I don't mean did you view all 200 hours of it, but this interview that you and Officer Vickers had with Mr. Thomas, have you viewed that? Yes. Okay. And was it a fair and accurate recordation of the interaction that you and Officer Vickers had with Mr. Thomas? Okay. I, I don't think it matters if it was Judge McBurney's body cam, if Officer Vickers was present, I'm sorry, if Officer Barnett was present. My concern is not the seven minute and 45 second segment. If in fact, Officer Barnett was present for the entirety of it, because it could have been a ring camera on the front door of Mr. Swain's house that recorded it. Uh, I think she's in a position to authenticate that just like she could authenticate a photo that someone else took at a scene where she was present. Um, what I do want to make sure is that we are only getting into the record um, that which Officer Barnett can authenticate. So you'll play into the record the seven minutes and 45 seconds. I'll let you tender states too, but you'll need to replace it at some point for posterity's sake. I'm not going to watch other parts of the disc, but for posterity's sake, just in case this goes to trial and it's a different prosecutor and you grab states too, and we're suddenly playing other parts of Officer Vickers' body-worn camera that Officer Barnett may not be in a position to authenticate. Um, so I'm going to allow it in over objection, total objection. Um, but what I'm allowing in is the seven minute and 45 second segment that you've identified, Mr. Costello, 4200 to 4945. Um, and uh, that's it. But so we can move forward today, I will actually take exhibit two. And then at some point, um, when you've got more technically inclined folks involved, they ought to create an extract, share it with um, Ms. Foster and Ms. Hawkins so that they can see 2A is actually um, just that seven minutes and 45 seconds. And at, you think this is a better version, and that's great. The defense is entitled to introduce um, the Vickers, I mean, I'm sorry, the Barnett version. I don't know why we would need both if, in fact, they're both standing there. But um, I don't see an evidentiary basis to exclude that piece there. What else did you want to get on the record, Ms. Hawkins? Yes, Your Honor. For the record, um, we were under the impression um, that cause this whole conversation about um, Mr. Maddox's testimony, we we're talking about Officer Barnett's body camera. Mm -hmm. And then the state comes and they bring in Officer Vickers' body camera through Officer Barnett, who has her own body camera. Um, so I just I wanted to put that on the record that the reason why we indicated that Mr. Maddox could be released from his subpoena was based on the representation of the state indicating that Ms. Barnett or Officer Barnett, I'm sorry, um, would be testifying. And she is testifying, but now she we're is. using someone else's body cam to um, get 
other evidence in. Okay, three things on that. One, um, I think the record is that Mr. Maddox wasn't subpoenaed. That doesn't change a whole lot, but I don't know that he appeared via subpoena. Number two, um, if you've got Officer Barnett's body camera, which it sounds like you do, because I heard Ms. Foster say to you and then through you, you can hear it just fine on hers, um, then you can use that with her um, to get the Maddox part in. And number three, um, I remain open to leaving the record open if the best way for you to explore what you want to explore is for us to get Mr. Maddox back here virtually, he's not in Greece, or in person. So one way or the other, you'll get the Maddox piece that you want to get in. I suspect it'll be category number two, meaning you've got Officer Barnett's body camera. You can authenticate that through her. I don't think there's going to be an objection from the state anyway. They may even have it on a disc if you don't, and we I'll ask to use their exhibit if they've got it. Um, and then you can explore with Officer Barnett what's on, on her body camera. But I'm not going to second guess one side or the other if they think there's a crisper video, and it's really the audio, um, that uh, is at play here. I think we've all heard people talking through masks, and they're at a hospital. So there's all sorts of stuff going on in the background. Um, so over objection, I am allowing in um, states two, and the state will just need to refine it it's exhibit two to the segment we're talking about at a later date. Thank you. Jim. Still more? You're still standing. No, I'm good, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Back to you, Mr. Costello. Thank you, Judge. Um, Officer Barnett, when uh, you and Officer Vickers spoke with the defendant, was he physically restrained in any way? No, sir. Uh, did you ever use your weapons in a threatening manner towards him? No, sir. Did you consider him to be in custody at the time? Was he read his Miranda rights? Okay. Did you uh, threaten or coerce him in any way to make a statement? Okay. And he freely and voluntarily gave the statement. Okay. And judge, this time uh, we will uh, publish that seven minute. Before you do that, Officer Barnett, um, I've been able to hear a whole lot of testimony about Mr. Thomas at Grady Hospital and um, I've heard some information about um, someone being present with Mr. Thomas, who Mr. Thomas represented to be his lawyer or a lawyer, and it may be this individual represented himself to be a lawyer or Mr. Thomas's lawyer. Um, when you and Officer Vickers had the interaction we're about to watch, um, had it been brought to your attention that um, Mr. Thomas had a lawyer there at, at the Grady parking lot? Um, he, while we were talking to him, he said that his lawyer was on his way. Um, and we were talking, his lawyer did come up. However, um, the lawyer never interjected. Never said, what are you doing talking to my client? Stop this, anything like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, and for the record, Judge, we're starting at the 42 minute mark on the dot. I don't think he has to have a shot, Frank. I think he's better than that. To where he would have accidentally done it. So you said he's standing next to him. Hey, Mr. Thomas, what are you doing? Come on. Yeah. Hey. Hold on. Hold on for a minute. Yes, sir. I'm going to cut you off. Hey, I, I got it. I, I got it. Oh, sir. Barnett and I got Officer Vickers need to talk to me, dog. So let me get off the phone with you. I'm gonna talk. Listen, listen to me. I'm gonna talk to Officer Barnett, and Officer Vickers, Officer Washington, and Officer York. I'm gonna get off the phone with you, and I'll call you back. Stand fast. Real, real. Okay. Okay. Just right now, real quick question. Yes. Where you? Where the? Where Mr. Carter go? You know, he was talking to you. All right, that's fine. So listen, real quick, I get 12 o'clock you, Cooper Her, right? How far away was Swain? Swain, how far Swain away was, was he? Swain was at my 9 o'clock. He was at your 9 o'clock, but was he next to you? Okay, or was he no, away? he went next to me. Swain was like... For that, for that edge cut in a okay. concrete, what's that? What would you estimate? So you could almost jump in. Six feet. Yeah, okay. What's that, six feet, eight feet? All right, please roll in six to eight feet. And from okay. here, swings at that red pole right there. Okay. Whatever that distance, y'all estimate. Okay, um, is he behind you or a little no, bit ahead of you? No, he's a little bit ahead of me. At that, let me back up, he's at that pole. Okay, and you fired one shot, right? 
One shot in my throat. And you know you hit. Uh, I don't two. know where I hit, but I'm at my throat. Okay. Did, and you never saw him with a gun? No. He did this. I kill you, motherfucker. He did me like this. And, you, and, you, and you, you got on first. And, and I had my charger. I had my charger, my phone, my car keys, and my gun onto my front seat. That's when I discharged. Was there anything between you and, and uh, Swain? Was there was there a vehicle between y'all or anything like that? No, I was on the street. And if you know, any of you guys know John Lewis Academy, the middle school. Yeah, we know it. middle school. We know it. I know that side street that has the houses and the front uh, corridor that you can do the turnaround. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. We on that one street. I'm looking this way. We got the street of the school right here. And also to your right is that single house on the corner. The single house on the corner is Swain's house. 688. 688. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That street, this way is the football field and the track. This way is the library for Atlanta Public Schools. Right there is Bankhead. Yeah. I'm right here. And the, my, my truck right there is on the sidewalk. Cause Technically a one-way street, yeah. but you can do a whoop de whoop. My truck right there ready to go that way, and the school is there. The sidewalk, did, did, uh, driveway, school. I got you. Just Swain have a gun? I don't know. You don't? Is it possible that he had a gun? Yes. Okay, so you hear me, Barnett? It's possible, but 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 but. I don't know, for sure. Yeah, that's fine. That's fair. That's fair. We get fair? it. Okay. Fair. I just want to be honest. And I'm gonna. And so once again, you painted a good picture right there, right? Yeah. If I'm Swain, I can see I'm about six to eight feet, like you said, right? There's well, nothing in between you, us. If you swing, back up one more step. You right there. And there's nothing in between us. No vehicle. No nothing. There's a sidewalk. My truck. So if I do something, I, I, I can throw it straight at you and hit you, right? You can hit me or the truck. All right. Cause my driver's side door is open. Okay, I got you. I got you. Got my truck here. That guy coming toward me in front of my truck on Elizabeth, coming toward me. Okay. Um, now, Swain stay in your car. In all time? piece of transparency, my attorney is on his way right now. That's fine. Out of transparency, <laughs> do can I continue to talk to you? That's up to you. With, I mean, we're, we're just trying to sort this we're thing. First of all, we're trying to figure this whole thing. I didn't murder or try to murder or do nothing. Self-defense. I'm fine with that. I know my stance in society, regardless, black, white, regardless. But I'm just letting you know my attorney's on his way down. Look, As y'all being transparent we're, we're talking, with me, you're I'm not being transparent with you. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're just piecing things together. That's all yes. we're doing. We're trying to yes. piece everything together. So let me ask you a question. Did Swain ride to the barbecue with you? No. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's his fine. house. That's, that's his house. He was already there. That's his house. So, I'm here, though. I'm standing right here. So, he, that's his house. Yes. But as soon as he got shot, y'all put him in the vehicle and drove what? here? Really? Don't worry about that. Hey, listen, listen. Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas, stay with me, please. Don't, let, let that go, man. He's just upset. Let that go. Thomas, talk to me, all right? I'm sorry. I'm swing. As soon as I got shot, you threw me in the car and then drove here? Or you did something else? Well, did he go, got shot. Did Swing go in the house? No. What happened was, whatever happened to the gentleman in front of my truck, a bunch of people grabbed him. Took they off. disappeared. Okay. Like everybody's yelling, hey man, goddamn, what the fuck? So, I don't know what he may have had, what he may not have had. I'm being honest, in his defense, we don't know. Because they crowded him and they did. Okay. Swain was right here. That guy who just walked off in a purple shirt was like, there, uh, Swain down. I said, Swain, what the fuck? We don't know. So me and him scoop Swain, drop my back seats in my truck, throw him in the truck, and drove here. And that's when I met you in Washington. Okay. So, one more question. Who's the guy in the green? He was there also. That's one of my student athletes. I got you. That's one of my student athletes. Did he witness any of it? Evidently, no. The way he just approached me in front of y'all. But he was there. We talked earlier 
about bullshit that was happening in the quote unquote barbecue. Him and Swain. I'm going to be very transparent. I have shit to hide. Him and Swain, the guy that I brought here, best of friends. And I pledge both of them. We're all in the same fraternity. I pledge both of them at the same year group. But outside of him, Swain is his partner. Um, Stone Mountain. What bothers me here, this guy is my student athlete for Morehouse. And I have no problem being honest with everybody. I run my information low. I'm the associate athletic director. Okay. Mr. Thomas, can we lose yeah. contact? What's a good phone number for you? My name is Seth. My number is 770-696-0369. On the website, I'm Dr. Thomas, and that's my phone. Mr. Yeah. He's personal friends with Swain, so I don't know the whole display that he can do this night. The record judge uh, stopping the body camera at 49 minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, Officer Burnett, I'm going statement that's captured on Officer Vickers' body cam. Uh, you heard the defendant say that Swain was six feet away. Approximately, yes, sir. And you also heard the defendant say that he never saw a gun. Yes, sir. And that the gentleman in front of my truck didn't know what he may or may not have had. And during his statement, he never mentioned anything about a lunge. Officer Bolton, I don't hear the witness. The microphone, you are far from the microphone. So, um, Ms. River, that was our court reporter you just heard from, not the Lord. And um, <laughs> I was close. So, you need to lean in, and uh, there you go. Uh, during the defendant's statement, he never mentioned anything about a lunge. No, sir. Oh, I make a record. Every time a crime is committed, do you always make an arrest on scene? No, sir. Do you have discretion to make arrest? Judge, I don't think I have anything further. Officer Barnett, um, there were a bunch of officers standing around there. We've heard from a couple um, during the course of these proceedings to include someone with the title of investigator, McManus. I think I saw him walk in there. Of those of you who were present at the scene we just saw you know, at, at Grady interacting with Mr. Thomas, um, which one of you would have had the authority to arrest if that decision was, who was gonna be making that decision out of all of you wandering around? It would be me or the investigator. You or McManus, okay. Ms. Hawkins, do you have questions for Officer Barnett? Yes, Your Honor, I do. Um, I know it, this is aside from the questions, but um, I know that there was some instruction given to ADA Costello to play the sound without just messing up the whole audio system. I'm just trying to figure out how to play the sound without throwing everything off. I don't think me. You want to play only sound? No, sound and video. You want to do what the state's been doing? Yes. So um, is this the Hawkins connection here? Yes. Okay. Um, when you do share screen, um, there. Let me let me try first. Um, oh. uh, down at the bottom, there's a share sound and optimize for video clip. Make sure you check both those boxes, and then it should be a happy space. Good afternoon, Officer Barnett. Good afternoon. How are you? And well, how about yourself? I'm good, thank you. Um, so just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, I know the state just asked you um, whether Mr. Thomas said that he had, that Mr. Cooper had a gun and your answer was no, correct? Correct. Right. Um, during that video that you just watched, Officer Body, uh, Officer Vickers' body cam, um, Mr. Thomas was making a hand gesture as well, correct? Can you... When he was explaining to you how Mr. Cooper was approaching him, mm -hmm. did he not have his hand behind his back? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and that was as he was telling you how Mr. Cooper approached him. Yes, ma'am. Um, and you, 
being the first responding officer, you filed a report or you wrote a report in this uh, case, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. Um, and in that report, you detailed the information that was provided to you, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, and during your investigation of this case, you were able to speak to several witnesses, correct? Yes, ma'am. And one of those witnesses being Mr. Frederick Maddox, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you added in your report the things that Mr. Maddox told you, correct? Yes, ma'am. And you also recorded his statement that he made to you on body camera, correct? Yes, ma'am. And your body camera was turned over to the district attorney's office, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, so it was a part of the file. Correct. Um, do you recall Mr. Maddox telling you that he saw Mr. Cooper rushing towards um, Mr. Bill? Thomas. I don't recall him, but okay. if it's in my report, he probably did tell me. If I showed you your report, um, would that refresh your recollection? Sure, yeah. One second, I'm going to show the prosecutor. Last four twenty one right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have your report, but I also have your body camera. Did the body camera refresh your recollection as well? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and I have it on a flash drive, um, but it's the same video. Uh, yeah. Okay. You, you're able to play a foundation, get it in theoretically, you can play it digitally, and then we can get a hard copy to judge later. Similar to how I have to redact. I have a hard copy already to give the judge today. Um, so you indicated to me already that you um, we're recording on body camera um, all of the interaction that you've had with the individuals that you were speaking to, correct? Yes, ma'am. And Mr. Maddox's conversation, Mr. Maddox is one of the persons that you were speaking to. Yes, ma'am. And his uh, interview would have been recorded on your body camera, correct? Yes, ma'am. And your body camera um, was turned over to the state and you didn't make any changes or alterations to that body camera, did you? No, ma'am. Um, so it is a fair and accurate representation of what was being recorded on the incident day, correct? Yes, ma'am. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to admit uh, what is going to be Defense Exhibit 1 into evidence. All right. No objection, Judge. All right. Defense 1 is Officer Barnett's body-worn camera footage. And, Your Honor, for the record, we're starting at 1.14.04. Uh, sorry, an hour, 14 minutes, and four seconds. Yep. Oh, yeah. He's up there. That's my boyfriend. Oh. Um, also, there's one. another Thank vehicle. Yeah. It's in the front. So we got to take that off. Take it off right Which now. one? Yeah, the one Coop was in. So I'm, I told no, you the one Coop was in, that's my car. Where, what car is that? My car is parked on the street right here. Not right there where the officer's at? No, no right, right on the side. Like, go across the street and then park right down the side. That's the marker. Okay. That's, 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 that's not a vehicle. I think that's another shooting. That's another shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. we've got to process that vehicle, okay? Not a big deal. No, 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 you're going to get your car back. Yeah, I see. You're going to get your car back. All they're going to do is my brother. He still got it. I had it. I took it. Yeah, you're going to get it. I took 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 it. You got the key? Nah, the, the top of that one was talking to me over there. He got the key. He got, oh, he's gone. Yeah, he already went down there to the car. It's literally right there with the go straight across the street. Okay. Right there where the, um, the first meter, the first parking meter box is, is right there. But yeah, he, um, he already got the key. Okay. He came to me and told me. My phone is acting up Okay, so, did you see what happened? I know. Yeah. Okay, you so saw what happened. You got your ID on you? If he already got my Yeah, just because it'll get lost somewhere. Did you witness the argument or just the or just the shooting? Yeah, I literally was in the shower. Oh wow. <laughs> like when I tell you I'm fresh out of the shower, maybe 30 minutes. <laughs> At least you're clean. Exactly. <laughs> At least you are clean. Yeah. 
whose car? She's moving his car from around. Who, who I drove here? From where they told me that he was already hard. So as they came and uh, as I came back down, by the time I'm walking down the driveway to go get her car to move it, he rushes him over there. He rushes him. Yeah. Okay. Literally, as he rushes him, my brother Chris, who was in there, you know, tries to stop. You're at Q as well? No. No, okay. That, that's my girlfriend's brother. Swain is her brother. It's her brother. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So, literally, as we come in, as I'm coming down, and he runs up to me, it's like three, like, Including the swing, there's two other cubes right there that are trying to stop him. He gets around it. So as he come up to him, you know, it's like he squares up. As he squares up, you know, and all that, he already got the gun drawn. He got the gun drawn. Oh, you don't have to shoot me. I ain't got no gun. How it hits him, literally how it hits him, is it, it's too much of a thing. Because the, the trajectory of it came down, boom, that's when he hit him in the leg. Okay. So it entered it. here. No, we hit him in the front. Okay. Came out. Hit Swain in place. Same bullet. One shot. Okay. He's on the with one shot. Okay. And Your Honor, for the record, the video is being stopped at one hour, seventeen minutes, and forty-eight seconds. But what you will do is get me actually a disc that's all of Officer Barnett's video because this is her, she can authenticate all of it and she has. Um, and I guess that's the what defense one is, but we just watched um, a copy of what you've given me for that segment you described. Yes, Your Honor, and I have a copy on a flash drive for you. Okay. Um, so Officer Barnett, you heard Mr. Maddox say he only saw the shooting, correct? Correct. And you heard him say that Mr. Cooper rushed the other guy, correct? correct. And um, you also heard Mr. Maddox say that Cooper said, you won't have to shoot me. Oh, really? Can you hear it in the video? Uh, kind of. Okay. But you also wrote a report. Correct. Right? Yes. And in your report, it would have said what you actually heard in the video. Correct. correct? Okay. So I'm going to show you what's already been shown to the state as your um, statement. And we're going to uh, Maddox, correct? Yes. Okay, got you. It starts on the first page. Okay. And is your memory refreshed? Yes, ma'am. So. Mr. Maddox told you that Cooper said to Bill, you won't have to shoot me. Yes, ma'am. Nothing further. I mean, one second. So, um, do you have any redirect, Mr. Costello? I have no redirect, Judge. All right. Um, may Officer Barnett step down? Yes. All right. Um, can we, why don't you stay on the stand if you don't mind, can we play the Maddox segment again that you just played, please? And you can probably skip the first minute of it where it's mostly your forearm and uh, you're getting the biographical information. Right, so if you go to 115, we're not gonna miss anything that I, I am wanting to hear again. Are you still morning watch? Oh, I'm day watch. Day watch, good. So we're not getting you after a long shift. Or, okay, good. Right there where the um the first meter, the first parking meter box is, is right there. But yeah, he um 
He already got the key. Okay. He came to me and told me. My phone is acting up. Okay, so did you see what happened? I oh, know. Yeah. Okay, so what happened? Mr. Addy on you? Even if he already got my stuff? Yeah, just because it will get lost somewhere. Did you witness the argument or just the shooting? Just the shooting? Yeah, I literally was in the shower. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, when I tell you I'm fresh out of the shower, maybe 30 minutes. <laughs> At least you're clean. Exactly. <laughs> At least you are clean. I didn't mean to keep you on the stand, but just in case anyone had questions about what we listen, I don't have any more questions. Sure. Okay. Officer Burnett, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Costello, any other witnesses? State rest, Judge. Okay. Um, I know there had been forecast some rebuttal, Ms. Foster, in the form of bringing Mr. Maddox back. We have brought him back virtually in the sense that um, we've now listened one and a half times to his statement to Officer Barnett. Anything else you want to put on in rebuttal? No, Your Honor. Uh, we don't need to call Mr. Maddox, but I do want to just point out to the court, Ms., uh, we also heard McManus's body cam who also had Maddox's uh, statements, and we heard it three times. Oh, we did. I just, um, for, I thought that was the rebuttal you wanted to hear, and it, it may be partially that, because I'll note his testimony uh, in court was, I wasn't going out to move the car, and, and that was a, a source of conflict between um, the defense and Mr. Maddox. He said in both his interview with Mr. Investigator McManus and Officer Barnett, I was going out there to move the car. I don't know that that moves the needle a whole lot, other than it's inconsistent. And, and you can argue later. Um, but uh, yes, we got that in as well. Yes, sir. I, and yeah, I mean, I will say the part. Okay. All right. Um, so you don't need me to keep the record open for purposes of getting more from Mr. Maddox. Close the record for Mr. Maddox. And for everyone else. Yes, for everyone All everyone else. Else. We're right. Good. The record is closed um, and I am happy to hear from you all um, about why I should grant the motion and from Mr. Costello or Ms. Jackson as to why I should not grant the motion. And Your Honor, because this is my motion, I reserve the opportunity to open angles. I will give it to you. Okay. And also, if you don't mind, may I approach to give you copies of case law? Sure.
Thank you. Uh, hip. I have the list of cases that for you. Okay, so we've heard testimony from multiple people um, through the course of two days. So I'm just going to go through with the argument. Um, Your Honor, as you are aware, OCGA 16-321 allows an individual to use force in defense of self and others. The statute specifically states a person is justified in threatening or using force against another when and to the extent that he or she reasonably believes that such threat or force is necessary to defend him or herself or a third party against such others imminent use of unlawful force. However, except as provided in code section 16-3-23, a person is justified in using force which is intended to or likely to cause death or great bodily harm only if he or she reasonably, reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent death or great bodily injury to himself or herself or a third person to prevent the commission of a first forcible felony felony. It is our argument today that Mr. Thomas acted lawfully and in accordance with OCGA 16-3-21 when he fired one round at Mr. Kendrick Cooper on May 15th, 2021, following the threatening and forceful actions of Mr. Cooper. Hit V State. 293 GA 415 2013, which also cites Fair v. State 284 GA 165 2008, and State v. Yapo, and that's uh, GA. Sorry, I don't have the case site, the numbers in front of me, um, but it's a Georgia Act um, case and it's a 2009 case. And it states that Georgia's immunity statute bars criminal prosecution criminal proceedings against persons if they present sufficient evidence at a pretrial hearing to persuade the trial court that they were acting in self-defense. HIP further explains that sufficient evidence is evidence showing by a preponderance of the evidence that Mr. Thomas is entitled to immunity. So a showing of 51% is necessary. In this evidence, in this case, evidence came out in a hearing that Mr. Phil Thomas was at a friends and family cookout. One in which he was invited to by his fraternity brother and friend, Christopher Swain, actually his Neo, um, Christopher Swain. Um, and Mr. Kendrick Cooper turned a family friendly event into a contentious atmosphere. Stating that all the new members of Omega Psi Phi needed to get good with him or in other words, they needed to commit certain acts to demonstrate their status within the fraternal organization. In an attempt to keep the event family and friendly oriented, um, Mr. Thomas attempted to explain to Mr. Cooper that this was not the time or the place for that. This was not the time or the place for fraternity matters. We're here having a family and friends barbecue. This is not an Omega event. Um, and once away from the group of individuals who were sitting in this driveway, um, Mr. Cooper and Mr. Uh, Thomas went to the side where Mr. Thomas explained to him, hey, I'm not 2021. However, you can have a conversation with me. Obviously this upset Mr. Cooper um, and the, the interaction changed a little bit. Um, the dynamic of the party changed a little bit. Um, and Mr. Cooper, who indicated that he was the live five, became irate and he began to threaten Phil. Now, whether, and I'm just going to be as explicit as everybody else was today or today and yesterday, whether the words motherfucker was used, whether they weren't used, there were explicits that were yelled and there were threats that were also made. Um, and I'll kill you, or I will kill you, or I could kill you. But during that interaction, it is clear that Mr. Cooper gets upset. Um, and 
based on what Mr. Thomas testified to, which is very similar to what Mr. Carter testified to, and I'll go through his testimony separately, um, upset Cooper, then knocks Phil Thomas's drink out of his hand. And as he's doing so, he punches Phil in the face. Phil has to then clean up the mess that has been made by Mr. Cooper. And we get to Mr. Cooper spilling the drink on Mr. Thomas from Mr. Thomas showing deference. Everybody talked about deference while they were on the stand for the most part. Um, and as an act of, let's just squash this, Mr. Thomas says, hey, what are you drinking? Because I'll get you a cup of whatever it is that you're drinking. And then we get to Mr. Thomas's drink being knocked out of his hand and his face making contact or Mr. Cooper's fist making contact with Mr. Thomas's face. So Mr. Thomas walks away from the situation. He doesn't further engage Mr. Cooper. He goes to clean himself up. The evening continues. Mr. Thomas is over here minding his business. Coop is over here doing other violent actions that I'll get to in a second. Um, but Mr. Thomas is minding his own business. He's enjoying the rest of the night. Throughout the night, Mr. Cooper and Mr. Thomas get into another altercation. Um, Mr. Thomas has been instructed by other or encouraged by other fraternity members to go have a conversation with Coop. Coop is younger than you in the fraternity. You're the older person, go be the bigger person, go have a conversation with Coop. Mr. Thomas, goes to have a conversation with Coop. That conversation doesn't go so very well either for Mr. Thomas. Um, and that ends another negative altercation. Once that altercation ends, you have, according to Mr. Thomas, you have what transpires into the incident. And the incident is the shooting that we're here to talk about. Because honestly, Your Honor, the buildup is important to the immunity motion, but the moment in which Mr. Cooper, Mr. Thomas shot is what's most crucial. So Mr. Thomas is outside at his vehicle. He's getting ready to leave. No, he doesn't leave the party earlier because he doesn't have to. He's still enjoying the party just as everybody else is enjoying the party. Mr. Thomas is at his vehicle, minding his business, talking to his friends, getting ready to leave. And when he, I'm sorry. When you say, it's okay. When you say his friends, um, my recollection is that it's just Mr. Swain who's there with him at the time Mr. Cooper comes up. We've heard conflicting evidence about whether there were people trailing Mr. Cooper, trying to get him back into the car he'd come out of. Um, is there someone we didn't hear from who we should have heard from because he was standing right there with Mr. Thomas and Mr. Swain? No, Your Honor, my understanding is Mr. Carter was at some point near the vehicle, then he walks away. Right, 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 Mr. Carter, I forgot, you're right. Okay. But so. They're having a conversation. Mr. Carter goes, gets his plate that he never gets to take home. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, Mr. Thomas is minding his own business and he is at his car and he's getting his charger, his charger's in his hands, his keys is in his hands, um, his gun is in his hand. And all of a sudden, taking my shoes off. <laughs> all of a sudden, there is Cooper, who's been irate on more than one occasion, running, running with his head behind his back, just like this, pointing and threatening Mr. Thomas. And as he gets to Mr. Thomas, that is when Mr. Thomas backs back, oh, excuse me, backs back a little bit and fires one round. And that one round hits Mr. Cooper in the stomach 
And also, somehow ricochets, we don't know that because we didn't have a medical expert testify, but somehow finds a way and hits Mr. Swain. Mr. Swain, I'll get more in detail in his testimony, but Mr. Swain indicated that he wasn't the target of the shooting. Mr. Thomas did not mean to shoot Mr. Swain. The gun was not pointed at Mr. Swain. He just so happened to get hit as a result of Mr. Thomas stopping the threat that was coming at him. Now, Mr. Thomas told you that he was afraid. He was fearful. He didn't know what Mr. Cooper was going to do because Mr. Cooper had already got physical with him earlier. Mr. Cooper had already got physical with someone else. Mr. Cooper had put his arm around his neck and, and we, we know that it wasn't a tight chokehold, but he had already put his arm around Mr. Thomas's neck and made contact with him. What is your understanding of what the record shows about Mr. Thomas being present for the Cooper versus Bruce fight? My recollection is that he was not present. Um, Mine too. But he had heard about it because everybody's talking about it because when someone puts another person in a chokehold sleeper and they nearly, well, I think there was testimony that he, almost, that he went limp, he didn't pass out, but that's what they're going to talk about. And that was a conversation that Mr. Thomas had heard about. Um, but this man is charging at him. So, and not only is he charging at him, he's charging at him from a vehicle. Um, apparently, Mr. Cooper was getting ready to leave himself. But instead of leaving, he jumps out of a vehicle and based on somebody's testimony, he sees Bruce and he's jawing off at Bruce. And then he sees Mr. Thomas and now he's running, hauling ass towards Mr. Thomas. And as a result, he shot. And Mr. Thomas, on his test during his testimony, indicated that he fired one round. And that one round stopped the threat of Mr. Cooper. Mr. Maddox's testimony is that he kept coming. Mr. Swain's testimony is that he kept coming and he being Mr. Cooper. And the only time that he stopped Jam Mr. Carter's testimony is that he kept coming. And the only time that Mr. Cooper stopped is when he was shot. Your Honor, in Gilbert v. State, 94 GA Act 217, 1956, um, the court reversed judgment in a homicide case because it appeared that the defendant had no desire to fight and intended to fight only to the extent that a defense of his own person was necessary. It's clear that Mr. Thomas, at the time of this shooting or throughout the night at all, had no intention to fight or get into an altercation with Mr. Cooper. At the time of the shooting, Mr. Thomas was at his own vehicle. He was getting ready to leave the premises of the party. Mr. Cooper was the only person with a vendetta. He jumped out of a car to attack Phil. In previous conversations that I've had with the state, it was mentioned that you can't bring a gun to a fist fight. However, there was no fight. The word fight insinuates that there's an exchange of physical blows. There was no exchange. Just Mr. Cooper aggressively, verbally, and physically assaulting Phil. Well, another argument would be there was a single exchange, one bullet, and there wasn't a whole lot Mr. Cooper got to do after that. I don't disagree with you saying there was the approach, but um, there is some evidence that um, then Mr. Cooper stopped and either was like this or like this. We've got about 19 different versions about how his hands are, which is, I think, trouble for both sides at this juncture and maybe later on. Um, but uh, I, I understand what Gilbert stands for. Um, I, I haven't read Gilbert, but it sounds like maybe there was a, a situation where someone said, I don't wanna fight. 
Um, and here uh, we have um, some testimony that um, Cooper was trying to verbally engage your client and instead of verbally engaging your client shot him. And that's if you believe it, it just depends on whose testimony that you believe because right. Warren, you need to help me work through that. Yeah. And I guess you're getting there. Like, I intend hey, to, Your okay, Honor. Good. <laughs> then I'll be quiet. Okay. Um, so um additionally, fists weren't mentioned. However, what Mr. Cooper did say was, I'm going to kill you. Um here there was absolutely no intent no mutual intent for mutual combat. Um, and the reason why I'm addressing mutual combat is because there are individuals who testify that there was some back and forth. Um, there was no readiness and willingness on the part of Mr. Cooper to, I'm sorry, on the part of Mr. Thomas to engage Mr. Cooper in a physical altercation. Um, and reluctance, or fighting to repel an unprovoked attack is self-defense and is authorized by law and should not be confused with mutual combat. And as your honor is also aware, the reasonable person standard is used as a test to determine justification. Um, according to Andrews v. State 267 GA 473, 1997, to establish justification, a defendant must show the circumstances were such as to excite the, the fears of a reasonable person that his safety was in danger. And that's also citing WETA, W-E-T-T-A, B State 271 GA App 128, 1995. In Andrews, the court found that the appellant did not act as a reasonable person. The fact of the case is that the appellant and the victim were in a restaurant to were at a restaurant to provide transportation to different restaurant employees. The appellate was waiting inside the glass walled building while the victim was sitting in the car. As they performed their closing duties inside the restaurant, the male employees teased the female employee about the victim, her boyfriend. When the female left, the appellant held the door open for her and called her boyfriend a punk. The victim heard the epithet and responded angrily. When words were, words were exchanged between the appellate and the victim, the victim exited his vehicle and as he placed a key in the car trunk lock, promised to show the appellant who the punk is. At that point, the appellate pulled a handgun from his pants and shot the victim in the back. The appellant ran to where the victim lay on his stomach and shot him three more times in the back before fleeing the scene. It was unreasonable for the appellant in that case to shoot someone in the back who had not made any threats. It was unreasonable for the appellant to feel threatened when no threats were made. It was unreasonable for the appellant to stand over the victim and shoot three more times. It was unreasonable for that appellant to believe his safety was in danger. However, we don't have the same circumstances in this case. Mr. Thomas was threatened. Other people heard the threats. And it wasn't just a regular, hey, I'm going to hurt you. It was, I'm going to kill you. I should have killed you. Ideally, when I had the chance. When I had you in that chokehold, that could have been a sleeper, I should have killed you then. So then now you have Mr. Cooper charging, running full speed, according to Mr. Cooper himself. He was running as fast as his little legs could go. He's running full speed and he's still yelling threats. He's still saying, I'll kill you. And he gets shot one time in the front as he's continuously moving towards Mr. Thomas. He's not shot in the back. He's not shot in the side. And then Mr. Thomas doesn't stand on top of him and shoot him again, although I think what Mr. Cooper testified to is that he had me dead to rights. After I got shot, I dropped. And he could have stood over me and he could have took me out. That didn't happen. What Mr. Thomas did was he stopped the threat that was coming at him. The physical threat, because you have this man charging at you with what Mr. Thomas saw in the dark was 
one hand behind his back, charging at you. You don't know what he has. Mr. Thomas didn't know what he had, but he's running full speed. So there's a physical threat, and then there's the verbal threat that he's making as he's charging at him. It's reasonable for Mr. Thomas to be in fear of Mr. Cooper. It's reasonable to believe that Mr. Cooper, an ex-Marine, a boxer, jujitsu uh, professional, a instructor. So we don't know what parts of those things that, that's why I asked you about the Cooper versus Bruce fight. Um, I don't think it's in the record that um, Mr. Thomas knew that Cooper was a jujitsu instructor or um, was actually a semi-pro fighter. Um, I know he knows it now um, and he may have learned it because he's looked at discovery, but on the night of May 15th, um, I think the record is, he certainly knows everything that he and Cooper have interacted with. His version of events is um, punch me in the face through my drink would have been a whole lot more compelling to say almost choked me out. I'm going to have to work through how Cooper says I didn't punch him, but I almost choked him out, but that's routine because that's what happens at Q parties. Um, whereas um, your client says, well, it's just one punch. Um, either way, those things he knew, he experienced them. And then there's the hearsay, but it's in. Um, he heard people say Cooper got a little rough with Bruce. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know that the record allows me to conclude that Mr. Thomas knew these things you just rattled off, that um, this guy is like a human I guess ninjas were human, but just he's just this, he's a warrior. We yeah. did get him to testify. I'm a warrior. I don't know that um, Mr. Thomas necessarily knew that the night of the 15th. But what Mr. Thomas did know is that he was a Marine and he'd kill him with his bare hands. Okay. If, if I find that statement was made, you're right. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think Mr. Thomas's case is much different than the case that I just explained as, as we got to the, the guy who got shot on the ground. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's how we get to the reasonable person standard. Yep. Um, no, I think it is compelling that um, what happened. At, I mean, you're going to get there probably but what happened after the one shot, there was not a second shot or a third. We're standing over him saying, I got you um, anything like that. It's rendering aid, not to Mr. Cooper, but to Mr. Swain um, interacting with law enforcement, all that. that that's um, uh, something that I need to weave into thinking through what was going through Mr. Thomas's head. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and in explaining that the facts of Mr. Cooper's, uh, Mr. Thomas's case is much different than the facts of- um, Andrews? Yes, Andrews. <laughs> um, Mr. Thomas didn't make any threats to kill Mr. Cooper. No one testified to that. Um, also, there was, like I said, the, I'm gonna call it an assault because it probably wasn't wanted or battery where um, Cooper does put his arm around Mr. Thomas's neck. Um, though he doesn't choke him all the way out, there is that action. Um, and then the charging at Mr. Thomas with his hand behind his back. And I know that there's discrepancy about that. And I know that initially it sounds almost impossible to run with your hand behind your back, which is why I demonstrated how he could have run charging at him with one hand unvisible to Mr. Thomas. And then also Mr. Carter testified that he had on these basketball shorts. So when he's running, he's pulling his pants up. So Mr. Thomas being a distance from Mr. Cooper only sees this and it looks like his hand is, but he doesn't see him actually pulling his hand, his pants up but his hands behind his back in that moment and he's charging at him. Um, so we have that. And there's nothing that even Mr. Well, Mr. Cooper does say that a drink was smacked out of his hand. But Mr. Cooper also said that everybody saw that, that Swain saw it. And there were other people during this intervention where the drink was smacked out of his hand, but no one else testified to Mr. Thomas physically touching Mr. Cooper at any point 
throughout the night. The state presented evidence that Mr. Cooper didn't have a gun. However, LSV State 168 GA App 757 1983 states that the determining factor in self-defense is not whether the victim was using a deadly weapon, but whether the defendant reasonably believed the amount of force he used was necessary to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself. It is not important that Mr. Cooper did not have a gun. What is important is that Phil, as a reasonable person, believed based on the actions of Mr. Cooper, the threats, the jumping out of the car, the charging at him with his hand behind his back, and his determination to get to Phil. And when I say determination, he's running people off. He's blocking people from trying to stop him. He's pushing people out the way. Um, his testimony, and I, I, I was going to get to this, but his testimony is that I ran at him, charged at him full speed because I assumed that people were going to try to stop me from getting to Phil. He was determined to get to Phil. So Phil, it's, it's what Phil believed the necessary force was used, what force was necessary to be used in order to stop that threat or to, and to stop and prevent death or great bodily harm against himself. The Georgia Supreme Court in State v. Sutton 297 GA 222 2015 held that evidence was sufficient to support finding that defendant shot his brother-in-law because he reasonably believed such force was necessary to prevent death or great bodily injury to himself or his mother, and thus that the defendant was immune based on justification from prosecution. In that case, in July 2013, Sutton and his sister, Sherry Hardiman, were upset with their sister, Susan Anderson, and her husband, the decedent, for taking money from their mother, from the mother of the three siblings. This had been going on for some time, and the mother was ill health and suffering from some dementia. On July 26, 2013, Sutton spoke with Susan Anderson and told her that her practice of taking money from their mother had to stop. Later that day, Sutton received two threatening voicemails from calls that were made on Susan Anderson's phone. One of the messages was from the deceased. In it, the deceased complained about statements that Sutton had made about him and then screamed into the phone, you know me, motherfucker. I'll come up there and goddamn tear you a new ass. In the second voicemail, the decedent's stepson in a profanity-laced call told the appellee that the next time he saw him, he better goddamn be ready. On July 27, 2023, Sutton and Sherry Hardiman went to their mother's apartment to see how she was doing. Susan Anderson also stopped by her mother's apartment and a controversy erupted over whether she was going to get money from her mother. Hardiman and Sutton told her she could not get any more money. Susan began screaming and cursing. Sutton called Officer Randy, um, Randy Ridgden, and asked him to come to the mother's house. Officer Ridgden did so and Susan left. The officer listened to the two voice messages the appellee received the previous day. Officer testified that it was apparent to him that Sutton was very concerned for his safety. The officer added that the mother told him that he did not want the decedent to come back to her home. Later that day, um, the officer went by the decedent's home to convey that message. Um, despite this message, the decedent, his wife, and another gentleman went to Sutton's home at about 8.50 in the morning on July 28th. According to the officer, he and the decedent had been drinking beer, and the group went to the mother's apartment because... Susan was hell bent on getting money from her mother. Sutton was already at the mother's apartment when the group arrived. He was armed with a handgun, which he had placed on the sofa. Although the, uh, although the later arriving group saw Sutton's truck in front of the mother's apartment, Susan Anderson went into the apartment, leaving the door open. She saw the gun on the sofa and said, we've got one too. Sutton and Susan began arguing and then the deceased heard the argument he jumped out of his truck, ran towards the apartment, and 
Others tried to stop him. Rogers tried to stop him, stop the decedent from going into the apartment, but he couldn't catch him before he got to the door. When Sutton saw the deceased, he, he chambered around in his firearm and repeatedly told the decedent not to come any closer, but the decedent nevertheless continued to proceed through the doorway. Sutton then fired his weapon once and the decedent fell into the shrubs of the entrance the shrubs by the entrance of the apartment. He died from a gunshot wound to the abdomen. No weapon was found on the decedent. And in that case, the Supreme Court found that he was justified in killing the alleged victim in that, or the victim in that case. Um, this case is, that case is almost analogous to the facts of Mr. Thomas's case. A controversy started by Mr. Cooper erupted. Mr. Cooper verbally threatened Phil earlier at the barbecue, yelling and screaming um, in I'll kill you. Phil informed Mr. Swain, a close friend of his and, and as Mr. Cooper's of the verbal and physical assault. Mr. Swain attempted, though unsuccessfully, to defuse the situation, just as the officer had was trying to do in the reference case. Phil testified that he was concerned for his safety. Phil was minding his business, getting ready to leave when Mr. Cooper jumped out of the vehicle he was riding in to leave the incident and ran toward Phil, running at him so aggressively that others who saw him charging at Phil could not stop, could not stop him. Phil then fired his weapon once and Mr. Cooper fell to the ground, suffering a gunshot to the abdomen. Unfortunately, the bullet went through Mr. Cooper ricocheted off of something and hit Mr. Swain. And just as the Georgia Supreme Court found that Mr. Sutton acted in self-defense, I believe your honor has sufficient evidence to make the same finding for Mr. Thomas, um, as I believe that there's actually more than proof beyond a preponderance of the evidence that was presented over the course of the, uh, the two days. Um, I believe I also gave your honor a copy of State v. Green, um, and that's a two, 89 GA 802 2011 case where the defendant moved to dismiss the indictment charging him with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, um, claiming that he was statutorily immune from prosecution. Um, the facts of the case, and I'm not going to go all the way into the details of the facts of the case, but Green was in fear of death or in fear of a forcible felony that was being committed against him by Walden. Um, and the court found that Walden had placed Mr. Green in reasonable fear of his life and that he had acted in self-defense pursuant to 163-21. -16 Your Honor, in the state's questioning, well, back up some. Furthermore, Andrews, the case that I've already cited, states that when a defendant presents evidence that he was justified in using deadly force, the burden is on the state to disprove the defense beyond a reasonable doubt. In the state's questioning of the officers, he called to testify. He attempted to impeach Mr. Thomas and Mr. Carter. However, it was done unsuccessfully. Mr. Thomas and Mr. Carter didn't lie like the state wants you to believe. There were several officers out there. Phil was talking to multiple officers, as you saw from the three body cameras, or four maybe, that we saw in court. Um, Officer McManus testified, or Investigator McManus testified, that victims and witnesses don't always remember everything the first time they're, they're spoken to. When talking to Phil on the body cam, you can also hear investigator McManus interrupt him and say, hey, I'm not asking you to remember exactly. Um, you also hear Phil say, I've been talking to everyone. And throughout those different body cameras, you also hear him say, you also hear officers stopping him in mid-sentence. He's trying to act out. He's trying to tell them what's going on. They're like, hold on, wait a minute. I just want you to talk about this. Or I just want you to talk about that. So he, it, it's not that his, his statement is untrue. His statement to the police officers are incomplete because he's not allowed to finish telling everything that happened. Or you also see that 
one, he, he, he just shot somebody. So he's, and, and his friend is also shot, which he didn't intend to shoot. So it's like a disarray. He's, he's scatterbrained. There's still a lot going on. His adrenaline is still pumping, you know, after he's shot a person in self-defense and he ends up hitting his friend too. He gets up and he's immediately rendering aid. They're calling 911. They're in a panic. 911's not answering the phone. So what do we do? We throw everybody in the car and let's go. We're good. 911 won't come to us. Let's go to 911. Um, so he's in a friend, like his, his, he's scatterbrained. There's a lot going on. And it's not just Phil who's scatterbrained. There's other people, other witnesses on the scene who are also scatterbrained. Um, so it's not that these statements are contradictory. It's not that these statements are impeachment material. These statements are incomplete. And when Mr. Thomas got on the stand, he had an opportunity to tell his complete story. And that's what he did. He told what happened to him, how it happened to him, and how it made him feel in that moment. And Mr. Carter's first encounter with McManus, there's a lot of him saying yada, yada, yada in his statement. Um, and then the state's trying to impeach him and say, well, did he say kill in the first statement? No, but he said yada, yada, yada. And yada 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 and whoop the whoop are ideally synonymous, and we heard a whoopy whoop too. So the second encounter, it I submit to your honor that that yada 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 was clarified with Mr. Carter saying, "I heard the word kill." Whether it was "I'll kill you," "I'll sh I should have killed you," he heard the word kill, and I submit to your honor that Mr. Carter is the only one who really has no reason to lie. He's a disinterested party. He has, he's friends with everybody. Um, so he has no interest in the, the resolution of this case. He indicated that Swain was his best line brother. They're friends. They saw each other last Tuesday. They still hang out, but he still came in and he still testified and indicated that Mr. Cooper jumped out of a car. He ran towards Phil aggressively. He had his hand behind his back as he was pulling his pants up and he was charging at Phil. There was nothing that could be done to stop him. That was his testimony. And your honor, even if you don't believe everything that Mr. Thomas said, you can find preponderance of the evidence just from Mr. Cooper and his testimony. Um, his testimony here and the statements that he made uh, prior to today's hearing that he was being asked about while on the stand. So this is what I get from Mr. Cooper. Omega Sci-Fi is a non-hazing non organization and hazing is unauthorized actions condoned by the fraternity. But he didn't say hazing doesn't happen. In fact, he said there is a spectrum of hazing. So just because you're over here on the lower end doesn't mean it's not hazing, but it's not this high end of hazing. Um, and hazing, Your Honor, I'd submit to you, is Mr. Cooper calling out all the NEOs, calling out all the new initiates to come meet him and to come get good with him. According to Mr. Cooper, the Neos were still getting used to the environment of Omega. And although he said on the stand that nothing specifically made him that important that the Neos needed to come meet him, he also said that if one of the Neos were to say, F you, I don't want to talk to you, that would be rude because he's older in the frat. He didn't want to meet the older bros. He wanted to meet the younger ones, the new ones, the ones who weren't used to the Omega environment. Phil, an older bruh, pulled Mr. Cooper to the side, a gesture that Cooper indicated was a respectful way to do things in the frat. And so Cooper, it wasn't the time or the place for that. Coop took that to mean, and this is his own testimony, that calling the Neos out could escalate to something negative. Coop testified, or Cooper testified that he was walking away from Phil. That ends interaction number one. As the evening progressed, P 
people were coming up to an allegedly already calm Cooper, telling him to calm down, telling him to relax. Second interaction is Cooper approaches Phil after what can be considered hearsay statements made to Cooper by other people and says, hey, keep my name out your mouth. I don't see how anyone can say walking up to someone and saying that is done in a friendly manner. Like Cooper tried to say it was. Keep my name out of your mouth is aggressive in any context. Phil walked away from Cooper. And as you can tell from his um, testimony, that pissed him off. You're gonna walk away from me when I'm talking to you? People, after that second encounter, people are still coming to an already calmed down Cooper, telling him to calm down and relax still. It's almost impossible to believe that this show dog, this live five, this person who doesn't just sit in the corner drinking his drink, this warrior is as calm as he tries to make it seem. Interaction number three. The next interact, the next, the interaction number three is an intervention with Cooper and Phil and the other and other bros, including Swain, according to Mr. Cooper. And although Swain testified that he wasn't there for that part. Cooper alleges that there was a back and forth between him and Mr. Phil, and Phil throws a drink on him. There's no testimony from anyone that Phil drew, threw a drink on Mr. Cooper other than what Mr. Cooper says. There's no testimony that Mr. Cooper had to clean himself up, although there's testimony that Mr. Thomas had to clean himself up after he was after his drink was punched out of his hand. During that interaction, Cooper testifies that he did a jujitsu move on Phil Thomas, a move that is intended to incapacitate and or subdue and on direct indicated that the move could put someone into a permanent sleep depending on the person. He testifies that he then leaves Phil's presence after whispering in his ear or something, but then goes back and does this same jujitsu move on someone else, except that one was a little more serious because he called someone to come to get weak in the knees or to go limp. I won't add words, but that was my interpretation. Incident or encounter four. After Cooper has now changed clothes in the middle of the living room, he goes outside and he sees Phil again. Phil is outside minding his business. Nobody's thinking about Cooper. You are not the center of attention, sir. Everybody has moved on. But Cooper sees Phil and he gets riled up again. He's with the rah-rah, he's, he's on it. Then there's some alleged back and forth between Mr. Cooper and Phil. And his fraternity brothers are telling him, bro, just leave, just go. You already said you had something to do. You, you, you're dressed, you got, you, you, go, leave. Cooper said, I ain't going nowhere. I'm not leaving. Why well, I gotta go? I just wanna talk to the man. I wanna talk to Phil because it's not safe to have an issue with someone in Atlanta that he doesn't know. However, on cross, when attorney Foster was asking him, well, it wouldn't be safe for Phil to have issues with somebody um, that he doesn't know in Atlanta. It was different for Phil. Phil can have issues with somebody he doesn't know, but Mr. Cooper can't. After four negative encounters with Mr. Thomas, then we get to the incident that leads up to the shooting. Cooper jumps out of a car and hauls ass, his words, not mine, at Phil, full speed, as fast as his little legs could go. He's running full speed because he assumed that if he walked up casually, he would be stopped by other people 
and unable to get to fill. Those are his words. He didn't want to be stopped. Mr. Cooper indicated that Phil allegedly had one hand behind his back. But although Cooper also testified that if someone has a hand behind their back, then they have a projectile, not a knife. However, Cooper kept running at Phil. He kept charging at Phil. He never stopped. Cooper, the state's witness and alleged victim, said all of his scuffles or fights were on defense and not offense. That's what Cooper said about his interactions. The moment Mr. Thomas fired his one shot, he was on defense. Mr. Cooper also said, no one shows up to the party wanting to do stuff, but if I have to defend myself, I will. I know there was some conversation with the state and Mr. Thomas on direct. Oh, so you just bring a gun to a cookout? No, I bring my gun everywhere I go. 99.9% .9 of the time, my gun is with me and it's in my car. Mr. Thomas didn't come to shoot anybody. But in the words of Mr. Cooper, if I have to defend myself, I will. On May 15th, 2021, Mr. Thomas was put in a situation where he had to choose himself. And in that situation, in that moment, he did choose himself because that was the only thing that he could do. And because that was the only thing that he could do, he should be justified. His actions should be considered justified and he should be immune from prosecution. Thank you, Ms. Hawkins. There's one little yellow piece of paper up there. I don't know if that's yours or if that was already up there. That's my sticky note that says judge's copy. Of All right, <laughs> thanks. Mr. Costello. Hey, judge, uh, may I approach with a copy of a case I intend to cite? Sure. I have a copy for the defense as well. Thank you, sir. It's a cab case, huh? I had to bring one. I had to. So I saw we had a Judge Baxter case from uh, Ms. Hawkins. You did. Uh, thank you, Judge. Um, before I begin, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a roadmap of, of how I'm going to take this final argument. Um, you know, I'd like to, to classify the type of force that was used. Uh, by Mr. Thomas in this case, we're going to look at the statute. Uh, we'll apply the facts that are in evidence to that statute, talk a little bit about some case law, and uh, then I'll end with some, some policy considerations for the court. Uh, but first, I would like to address a few of the things that the defense brought up in their case, uh, or, or the, the beginning portion of their final argument. Um, the Gilbert and Andrews cases are uh, references to jury trials and not immunity hearings. Uh, in the Sutton case, um, I think that the facts of that case are quite distinguishable from what happened in our case in that there was three prior incidents of threats before the actual uh, act that was ultimately deemed to be justifiable. Uh, and it was also where the defendant was, was coming to a home um, and, and that's not the case here as you know, Mr. Thomas was, was at Christopher Swain's home and, and Mr. Cooper was staying with Mr. But Swain. In, in Sutton, as I understood it, and I understand it only through Ms. Hawkins's narration of it, um, in Sutton, the person who was shot was coming not to Mr. Sutton's home. Mr. Sutton was there um, with his mother-in-law. And I do think it was... I do think it was the mother-in-law, um, but this is um, this is Mr. Cooper uh, not coming to 
necessarily a place where uh, Mr. Thomas is there to check up on the concerns of someone because that was a big part of the facts of that case. Okay, well, I'll, I'll read Sutton and 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 work through it. And um, I believe that the defense talked about um, you know the defendant's statements made to officers and and how they interrupted him and. Uh, maybe you're not getting a full clear picture of some of the statements made by Mr. Thomas at the hospital because he was scatterbrained. And, and I do think he was scatterbrained because Mr. Thomas was talking about some things that were outside of the necessarily the realm of the shooting. And I think the officers were trying to boil down what actually happened in the shooting. Kept wanting to tell him about the chapters and the different chapters. That's not uh, what they were interested in. It, it, it did not appear so, Judge. And and last, there's this um, this line about uh, Cooper being a Marine who could kill someone with his bare hands. And, you know, the defense can address this with their reserve time, but I don't believe that's in evidence. That may be related to uh, an interview that I had with Mr. Cooper that's in discovery, but I don't think that that's really part of the facts of this case and, and what led up to uh, the ultimate incident. Well, and I'll, I'll sift through that. I don't want folks to spend too much time on that particular line. I think there is in evidence some witnesses saying, I heard Cooper say something with the word kill in it as Cooper is approaching Thomas for that final encounter. Um, I think there are disputes about that, but there are people, to include Mr. Thomas, who have said, this is what I heard Cooper say as he's heading towards me. Um, I'm standing at my car and he's coming towards me. So whether the Marine thing is swirling around, I'm going to factor that in the same way. Did anyone know that this guy was a jujitsu white belt or anything like that? I think a lot of that um, was brought out to help paint a particular image of Mr. Cooper, which is not irrelevant, um, but it's not germane to the calculus of what would the reasonable person do in Mr. Thomas's situation if the reasonable person didn't know that particular fact. Yes, Judge. And, uh, you know, so uh, in classifying the type of force that is used in this case, uh, Mr. Thomas did use deadly force, right? Uh, you know, a firearm is a deadly weapon when it's uh, used in the manner in which it's intended to do. So in this case, it was pointed in a direction of a person that was fired, it was discharged, a round went out. If he was pistol whipping somebody, it would be an object that's offensive and it would have been indicted totally differently. I haven't heard the defense say they need to meet a lesser burden, that they're acknowledging that because it was a firearm and it was fired, it wasn't used as a a projectile as in someone threw the gun at uh, Mr. Cooper, but um, that Mr. Thomas shot it, that they need to prove by preponderance that it was reasonable to use deadly force. And under 16.321, Judge defendant can only use deadly force if he reasonably believes such force is necessary to prevent death, great bodily harm, or a forcible felony. So we're not talking about a forcible felony here, even if uh, your honor were to take into account that uh, why aren't we because the question i had for you is if the only thing i credit is mr cooper's testimony which ought to be most favorable to him it's his version of offense um according to him he committed an aggravated assault on um mr thomas earlier that night he's saying it was in defense because mr thomas tried to tackle me um, having met the two of them seems ill-advised because Mr. Cooper's going to get the better of him. And he quickly did this jujitsu hold. My legs were here and pressure, but then I let him go. Once I had established that, hey, I'm in charge and this isn't going to end well for you. So Mr. Cooper had done that. And now he's zooming towards, by almost everyone's account, he's, his own account. Again, I'm going to, I am as fast as my little legs can take me. I'm running towards um, Mr. Thomas. And my hands are visible, but it's my hands that I'm going to get you with. Um, and I've already done it once. I mean, it was legs, too. It was all these jujitsu body parts. But why is it not forcible felony that Mr. Thomas is reasonably concerned? This guy is going to choke me out again. Strangulation, ag assault. Ag assault is a forcible felony. It's a, it's a pretty low hurdle because they've added forcible felony. And a lot of people think, oh, armed robbery is a forcible felony. It is, but it is the aggravated assault that's the part of the robbery that um, gets you there. And so walk me back from 
If all I credit is Mr. Cooper's testimony, it's reasonable to believe that he was going to commit an aggravated assault, a forcible felony on Mr. Thomas. And so Mr. Thomas was justified in saying, I'm not going to be choked out again. That wasn't so fun. So here you go. Yes, Judge. So I think Cooper's testimony about the jujitsu hold, the choke hold, is um, it's important that he said it's to subdue or incapacitate, and also that Mr. Thomas was acting as an aggressor towards him first. In that, in, no doubt, no doubt about it. And and so I'm not wondering why didn't you guys indict um, uh, DA's office from Fulton, indict um, Cooper for aggravated assault. But that incident had just happened. And so if we're thinking along the lines of Sutton, where um, what Ms. Um, Hawkins shared is that the sister-in-law of Sutton said, oh, we got one of those too, when she saw Sutton's gun. And then Sutton sees someone running towards him um, from a car, like, oh, he's got one too, so I'm gonna shoot him. It was reasonable for, and I, I understand there's more to Sutton, and I don't, I don't wanna run down that rabbit hole, but even if what Cooper did was in response to being tackled-ish, by a guy 10, 15 years older who is not a professional boxer, wrestler, jujitsu, et cetera. Um, now it's Cooper who is running after Thomas, who has just recently experienced the hold of death or whatever it's called. And after that incident ends, there is, if your honor recalls, there is a roughly a two hour gap where there is a de-escalation period. There are other members of the fraternity, other friends from the party. They're separating Cooper. They're separating Thomas. Mr. Swain testified that he was with Mr. Thomas for two hours, and there's nothing to discredit that testimony. And actually, the way that the timelines have been brought into evidence is actually, it, it kind of lines up because we have this encounter with Phil and Cooper where the jujitsu move is brought in at nine o'clock, and then our shooting doesn't occur until well after 11. And during that time, where Swain is de-escalating this situation with Mr. Thomas, who's on the phone, who's calling people, he's making comments about shooting Coop. He's all, there's well, testimony and evidence he's looking for a gun. Okay, you're gonna need to um, highlight that for me. Um, and you're talking about de-escalation. Maybe Swain is trying to de-escalate the Cooper um, uh, Thomas situation, but in that two hour window, we also have the, um, uh, Bruce with his tiny fists and Coop's at it again, choking someone out. And Mr. Thomas doesn't know all the details of how that played out, but I think the record shows that he's aware that Coop, maybe not a man of peace, managed to get into a different fight during those two hours. So it may be that Swain is trying to de-escalate Cooper versus Thomas, um, the record doesn't seem to suggest that Coop himself is spinning down, but rather either maintaining the, who do I fight next or spinning up? While he may not be spinning down because of the outcome of what happens in the home, he does make the decision to leave with family and friends when they decide to go to this other party and he goes into the living room to change. And it's while he's changing in the living room, well, that may not be the most preferred method to get change for the people in this room. Uh, it's where he makes eye contact with Bruce. And when he starts walking towards Bruce, Bruce is the one that actually engages based on Mr. Cooper's testimony that he raises his fists up. And as Mr. Cooper testified later, he was on the defensive with this jujitsu move. And again, these are moves from Mr. Cooper's testimony meant to subdue and incapacitate. Uh, no other individuals, to my knowledge in this case, needed to be treated at the hospital other than the ones that were shot. So I do think that Mr. Cooper, being the trained fighter that he is in a martial art, uh, used those moves to subdue potential threats and then disengaged before he could inflict more serious harm if he wanted to, and clearly appeared to have an upper hand in doing so. So um, the evidence that I have about Mr. Thomas trying to get his gun is through Swain's testimony. Yes, Judge. Okay. And I think that in that two hour time frame where phone calls are being made, 
There's an allegation that he was intending to shoot someone. He's looking for a gun. This looks like there's some premeditation forming. And we're talking about the element of intent for crimes that are indicted. And that's an, an element that needs to be proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt at a jury trial. And that's quite a hurdle for the state to, to make. While it can be inferred by proven circumstances and conduct, uh, it's still something that we need to prove. Uh, I do know that the defense also brought up the, um, while, while I'm speaking about intent, about that, uh, the, the fact that Christopher Wayne, Swain was not intentionally shot, that it's a ricochet, it's a through and through, there's some evidence about that. Well, here, Judge, is your classic law school textbook uh, hypothetical of a transferred intent case, which again is something that needs to be proven by the state beyond a reasonable doubt at a jury trial. No, I understand. There's also transfer justification. So if I find it's justified, I think everything goes away. But I, I don't, I don't, if this were clearly not self defense, if um, uh, Mr. Thomas from uh, 100 meters away had said, There you are, Cooper, I'm so mad at what you did. And Cooper's saying, Don't shoot, don't shoot. And he shoots him, hits Cooper, and it hits Swain. I get it. That's, I had never meant to hit my neophyte. Well, you did when you, when you shot Cooper, you hit um, Swain as well. So uh, going back to the statute, Judge, um, so I, I don't think that that Mr. Thomas was preventing a forcible felony at the time that Cooper is running at him. And I don't think that Mr. Thomas was trying to prevent himself from receiving death or great bodily harm. And that's from the evidence that we have from a defense witness, right? Mr. Carter is testifying not only on his direct and cross examination, but also in the body camera footage tendered in through the investigator. Cooper's running, his hands are out. He's making motions that the hands are up, the hands are visible, and that there is not a weapon in sight. Our, um, and maybe this is what's in Mullins. Um, is it? That's all right. Okay, that's a funny sound. That's the way of letting everyone know we're approaching two o'clock. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, if Mr. Cooper had been approaching with a machete, it's a totally different calculus. It's his hands, um, but hands can be deadly weapons. We know that that's more complicated, et cetera. Um, but uh, is there a case law you'd want me to look at that um, supports a trial court judge ruling denying a immunity motion because it wasn't reasonable to think that your opponent really could hurt you all that much. Um, and I'm thinking I mean, this is an exaggeration, but the guy who ends up shooting is six, nine, 300 pounds. And the guy who shoots, who's coming at him with his fists up is you know, five, two and 80 pounds. And I, don't, I don't think I have any particular case law on point for that specific issue. Mullins goes into kind of more of a verbal threat mm -hmm. in accordance with some additional actions that occur throughout the course of, um, of an evening at a party. Um, but I think that when we look at the test for preventing, uh, you know, great bodily harm or death, uh, we need to look at um, whether that threat is imminent. And I think because we have a significant distance that was testified about throughout this hearing, whether it was 200 feet when Cooper started running, 50 meters, 100 feet. It was all kind of a significant distance of probably 100 feet or more where Cooper starts running. Now, Mr. Thomas picks this up, as I think we get from Mr. Swain's testimony, where his eyes were moving towards something. And I think that's where Mr. Thomas could have made choices. Uh, he, he, and I know that we don't have a legal duty to retreat, but he could have made a choice um, throughout those hundred or so feet um, to get in a car and leave, to get other people at the party, to assist him. Uh, and I think that the timing factor of this is it's not imminent. He had he had more than 100 feet to react to what Cooper was doing and could have extricated himself from that situation. 
So the timing of this, it means it's not imminent. In looking at some of the evidence that was, was brought in, Judge, um, I wanna first start out with uh, some of the state's witnesses. And I think that Mr. Maddox uh, brings up a lot of good points from his testimony. I do understand that uh, there was some, he may, he may have had some confusion while he was testifying about the, the moving of the car. And your honor touched on that. It doesn't, might, might not move the, the needle a whole lot for you. But I think what's important about Mr. Maddox is, is he gives you a distance. He does it in not only his direct testimony, but in the two statements he made on the body cam uh, that Cooper's hands were up, they were visible, there was no weapon. Um, again, Christopher Swain's testimony, you know, we're, we're looking at a two hour window where he's de-escalating Mr. Thomas from whatever occurred between him and Cooper. And that during that two hour period, uh, there's some potential intent forming. There's a searching for a gun that's for some reason in the back of the car and not normally in the center console under the seat or in the glove box where Mr. Thomas usually puts his gun when he's in the car. And then he's arming himself in the process of that instead of leaving the firearm inside of the car where it would normally stay. Uh, also judge in cases of self-defense, typically we're looking at something that's like instantaneously happening. And I think that this cooling off period between whatever happened in the house with the jujitsu hold and the actual shooting itself, that two hour window, that takes any kind of instantaneous out of it. Yet again, this goes to the imminent threat as well. Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Cooper and the defense is harped on, you know, this was one shot, the threat was stopped. Uh, but Mr. Cooper did also testify, and I'm not going to rehash and belabor his entire testimony. I think what's important in his direct examination was that the gun, after it was discharged, was still pointed at him, and Mr. Thomas's finger was curled and still on the trigger. As far as the defense witnesses go, I, I've already kind of addressed Mr. Carter, and I do think that Mr. Carter provides a, a pretty uh, middle of the road, unbiased account, considering he is friends with a lot of people. There's really no, he doesn't have necessarily a stake in this game as maybe some of the other witnesses do. Uh, but Mr. Carter's statement did change with between the, the time, the 15 minute time frame where he gave the initial statement to investigator McManus to the second statement. And during that 15 minutes, investigator McManus does become involved in the interview with Officer Vickers, Officer Barnett, and the defendant. Uh, so it's possible that, you know, hearing the defendant interject the word kill in the statement he's giving uh, is maybe potentially influencing that second statement that Mr. Carter made. Uh, in looking at Mr. Thomas's statements on direct, um, I, I would say, Judge, that um, it is self-serving testimony. And as a trial court, uh, you, you are authorized to reject that. Uh, that's, in Ellis, that's, that's from Ellison v. State 313, Georgia 107. That's a 2022 case. And I think that we know- Can you the site again, please? Yes, sir. 313, Georgia 107. Okay. And I think that- you know, we, we know that it's self-serving testimony because there's, there's a lot of differences and inconsistencies throughout the multiple statements uh, made by the defendant prior to the hearing this week and what he testified to on direct. Um, if I recall correctly, on direct, he had mentioned that Cooper was lunging towards him with one hand up and one hand behind his back. Uh, that hand was Cooper's left hand, um, but there's no mention of a lunge in any of the prior statements after the incident at Grady Hospital, two officers. Uh, the defendant also testified that when he fired the shot, he was just a few feet away from Cooper. Uh, however, I think when you juxtapose that to the statements he made to law enforcement, there's several feet that he's talking about. He's talking about six to eight feet which is more consistent with what the other witnesses have said. And that's for Cooper, Swain, 
Maddox, Carter. They're, they're all saying that there is somewhere between six, seven, eight, a car length, a significant distance when the round is discharged. Also, the positioning of Mr. Swain is inconsistent in the defendant's statements. Uh, I believe on direct, he testified that Mr. Swain was in front of him. But in the prior statements to law enforcement officers, he's saying that Swain was off to his nine o'clock or to his left, which is incon that's inconsistent with some of what the other witnesses were saying, including Mr. Swain himself, who said that he was conversing with Mr. Thomas, turned around and tried to stop Cooper from coming at him. But we know that the evidence shows Cooper was coming directly at him. So Swain also must have been directly in front of the defendant prior to the shot being fired. And if you'll indulge me on the Mullins case in just a second, Mullins is about, um, it's about a case that the, the crux of the opinion is about Chandler evidence. And I know that we're not talking about Chandler, so just bear with me. I'll bring it all home at, at some point. I, but, but what's important in the analysis in Mullins is the focus that's um, made on the immunity hearing. I think it gives good guidance for us in this particular situation because the facts are pretty similar. Uh, and the, the site for Mullins for the record is 299 Georgia 681 2016 Mullins versus State. Uh, on the night in question, Mullins and his friend attend a house party in DeKalb County. Some of the party goers spill out from the house into the street. The victim and his friends are socializing. They're drinking at a house a few doors down. And the victim's friends testified that the victim was drunk and he was dancing on cars with his shirt off during this party. At some point, there's some gunshots that go off. People start leaving. And Mullins gets into his car in an attempt to leave the area, he almost hits the victim. So this leads to an exchange of words between the two. It's an angry exchange of words. And according to witnesses, Mullins brandishes a gun at the victim, but this first encounter between them, it ends and the victim walks away. Uh, several minutes later, a second encounter occurs between Mullins and the victim. Uh, Mullins told a witness, I'm going to get him, drove near the victim, uh, stepped out of the car and shot and killed him. Several witnesses testified that the victim was unarmed when he was shot. Mullins provided inconsistent statements to police. Uh, in one recorded statement, he admitted he never saw a gun, uh, but he did say that during that first encounter, the victim said he was going to get his tool, a euphemism for a gun. At trial, Mullins also testified that he shot the victim based on the fact that the victim mentioned the tool, but also because he had snatched it at his car door and moved his hands quickly. Mullins eventually is convicted at a jury trial and on appeal, they're looking at Chandler evidence, but at the immunity hearing, uh, where immunity was denied and this did go to a jury trial, uh, none of the defense witnesses stated that the victim assaulted or attacked Mullins at the time of the shooting. Um, at the time of the shooting in this case, after a two hour cooling off period, uh, there's not necessarily an attack. There's a running at somebody from 100 feet away, but not an attack. There's no blows landed. There's no jujitsu holds before the shooting. None of the witnesses said that they heard what was said between the appellant and the victim during you know, the second encounter that ends in a shooting. I think there's conflicting testimony about whether or not the word kill was said in our case. Um, Cooper says, I didn't say it. Um, Mr. Thomas said, he said, I'm gonna kill you. Mr. Carter said at one point, no, the, the word kill was not used. And another point he said the word kill was used. Mr. Maddox said the word kill was never used. And Mr. Swain said the word kill was never used. Uh, that's gonna be an issue that the jury should have to reconcile. Uh, the court pretty much analyzes and concludes that Mullins rationale in his shooting, it, it didn't establish a prima facie case for a justification jury charge. And it cited another case that I'll give you the citation for in a minute that verbal threats 
and fisticuffs do not justify the use of deadly force. Rather, which the citation on that is 273 Georgia 844 from 2001. Uh, the Georgia Supreme Court also said verbal threats and fisticuffs don't justify the use of deadly force. Uh, that's a case where the victim verbally threatened, took a swing at the defendant, and the court held that the defendant could not establish a prima facie case of justification because when he stabbed the unarmed victim, as Mr. Cooper was unarmed in this case, he was not honestly defending himself. In looking at this case, Judge, I think it's also, you know, it's, it's very important to recognize that Mr. Cooper didn't have a weapon at the time of the shooting, nor did he have a weapon at any point during the four to five hours that he is at this party. Uh, when you look at the defendant's version of the events that day, I think it's inconsistent uh, with a lot of the other witnesses that have been called to testify at this hearing. Uh, again, I think that that uh, testimony provided on direct from the defendant is self-serving. And I think that the evidence that's in this record is, is insufficient uh, to carry the defense's burden of proving uh, that by a preponderance of the evidence, Mr. Thomas's actions were justified on May 15th, 2021. And, uh, you know, just kind of ending with this policy question, Judge, I think, um, and I'm not breaking any news here that shootings are on the uptick in Atlanta over the past three years. Former Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom said that the reason for a lot of these shootings is the inability to uh, properly use conflict resolution skills. And that's exactly what happened in this case. There was an inability to use conflict resolution skills. And you can't use a gun to resolve conflicts such as this. You can't bring a gun to a fist fight. You shouldn't bring a gun to an argument and you can't settle a verbal dispute or somebody running at you where you don't know what they're gonna do with any kind of gunfire. You cannot settle a tussle with deadly force. So in conclusion, Judge, um, I would ask your honor to deny the immunity motion as I think the evidence in the record is insufficient uh, for the defendant to carry its preponderance burden and the defendant should not be immune from prosecution. Uh, I think that there's enough inconsistencies in this case um, to go to a jury and inciting Anderson v. State 245, Georgia 619, it's a case from 1980, uh, the fear in a reasonable man justifying deadly force is a jury question. Thank you for your time this week, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Costello um, and Ms. Jackson and your office for um, standing in for the Fulton DA's office. So Ms. Hawkins, you did reserve, um, I'm gonna give you just a couple minutes because you were very thorough um, and what you argued prompted my questions that I've already um, posed to Mr. Costello. So yes, Your Honor. when you're ready. Yes. Um, <laughs> there was nothing inconsistent about what happened in the moment that the shot took place. And Your Honor, we talk about policy and uh, using conflict resolution skills. Cooper didn't use any conflict resolution skills. Both, I think <laughs> it's very clear that both gentlemen would benefit from some anger management, conflict resolution, et cetera. Um, and you know, this, the state talks about policy. Georgia allows people to carry. And Mr. Cooper, I mean, Mr. Thomas was carrying legally. He's allowed to do that. And he's also allowed to defend himself because Georgia allows that too. Um, I think the state misrepresented a lot of the facts that they use in their argument. However, I'm not gonna go through that because your honor took very good notes. And I, I know you can sift through what was said and what wasn't said. Um, but to touch on the premeditation, which also touches on the Mullins v. State case that the state introduced. If this was premeditation on the part of Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas would have went to Cooper. Cooper came to Phil. The Mullins case talks about how 
I, I, I hear you on that. I didn't hear Mr. Costello saying um, this was all a plan and Mr. Thomas knew Cooper would come to him. What I heard him saying is if this were purely self-defense, then um, you're just almost like, oh my gosh, here he comes. But there is evidence, slight evidence, but there's some in the record that um, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Thomas had this animus, this anger, this something about Cooper, mm -hmm. and you've explained why he might. Um, but Mr. Swain says, I'm, I'm trying to get Thomas out of here because like, where's my gun? I need my gun, this Cooper guy. And then there's whatever mysteries going on with Mr. Royals. It's not in the record other than that there's testimony about he called, I think Mr. Thomas even talked mm -hmm. about calling a person he knew who was a trimu, who was Mr. Royals. Um, and, and so there, there's been some oblique references to that. And so I think it's appropriate for me to consider based on what little is in the record that um, there's something out there suggesting that um, Mr. Thomas was either scared enough, maybe more your argument, angry enough. That's the premeditation intent. Like, I'm going to get my gun because if this fool comes up in my face, I'm going to show him something. And so maybe that is the, it's not quite a preponderance that it's immunity. There's still a compelling self-defense argument here. I, I think that Mr. Costello had to acknowledge that in, in his closing argument. Um, but is that evidence of premeditation is in, I'm thinking about getting this guy enough to take us out of the, it was so pure as the driven snow self-defense um, when Cooper was coming towards him. And I have to weigh that with there being some testimony that Cooper says, hey man, you know, I don't have a gun. Um, and, and how does all that play out? So I just don't want you to spend a lot of time saying, there's no proof of premeditation. I, I didn't hear the argument being, this was an intentional killing, it's murder. The pushback was, it wasn't so much this, last minute reaction of here comes death and I'm going to protect myself from it. That for a while, Mr. Thomas might've been thinking, I want my gun because I don't like this guy. That's all. And again, that's who your honor decides to believe um, because I know this is not a jury trial, but you are the fact finder. I am You're not at a jury trial yet, or if we ever make it I there, but you get to determine um, what amount of credibility or the weight of credibility that you give to the other um, testimony. But I will say that the state indicated that on several occasions, Mr. Thomas could have made a different choice. Everyone could have made a different choice. Cooper could have made a choice not to call the Neos out. Cooper could have made a choice not to put Phil in the jiu-jitsu wrestling position. Cooper could have made the choice not to run charging at Phil and we wouldn't be here had he had made better choices. And for those choices, there are consequences. And as a result of the consequences, Mr. Thomas should still be immune from prosecutions, prosecution because he had to make a choice in that moment as well. And that was to defend himself. Got it. Thank you, ma'am. And thank all four of you attorneys um, for your work on this. Um, this is a messy one. That's why the motion was filed. That's why it wasn't sometimes immunity hearing is it's two hours max because there's the defendant has to testify and, and um, maybe there is one eyewitness, but this had a lot of moving parts. I appreciate you all filtering it because you probably could have called about six more witnesses each and all it would have done was make it murkier as to what happened. Um, and that may be what happens if this goes to trial, but um, I think you did a good job of distilling it as much as you could for purposes of what I need to work through. Um, I will take this under advisement. Um, I did take a lot of notes. This is page 27. Um, and if I have any questions, um, I will get emails to both sides and email to both sides saying, hey, um, it would help me if you could give me your recollection about what the record says or more accurate, more aptly, I will say, um, I want to give you a chance to either argue or send me two cases. You don't, no one have to file a brief. It'll just be great. Um, if I could have three days, I'm going to do my Westlaw. And here are two cases that I think um, are either on point or at least get you judge in the direction where you have a question. 
So if I am struggling with anything like that, I will open it up to both sides. You may get the email and say, oh, that's not a good email, but you'll have a chance to say, I'll see if I can find anything to convince you otherwise. Um, if it's silent, that just means I am working on this um, and we'll get the order out and then you all will proceed accordingly. Your next steps, one for each side, I'll need a revised exhibit two, more for the record. I'm not gonna um, be messing with uh, these discs all that much. And then um, I guess you've got it. Your step, your next step, Ms. Hawkins, you can do right now. Defense exhibit one is being handed to me and that is the body cam on a thumb drive of Officer Barnett. Um, and I'll put a sticker on it so we know what it is. Sorry. That's all right. Um, anything else, Mr. Costello for the state? Nothing from the state, Judge, thank you. All right, do you guys get some kind of travel per diem for having to come all the way from DeKalb or it's just part of the job? I think it's part of the job, Judge. Okay. We're close. Well, and at least our courthouse is open. Okay. We're back open. Oh, at long, long, long last, COVID and then the broken pipe? Um, Ms. Foster, anything else from the defense? No, All right, well, let's go off the record. Um, I have one question for you, Ms. Foster. Um, I, I'm not disrespecting you by not standing up, but because of my foot, I have to. Don't, don't, I, I don't. Approximately one week following the trial, Judge McBurney issued his ruling on the immunity motion. Defendant is charged with aggravated battery, aggravated assault, two victims, and firearm offenses, all arising from a single shot defendant fired at Kendrick Cooper. Defendant claims that he is immune from prosecution pursuant to OCGA 16-3-24.2 because he acted in self-defense. Having held an evidentiary hearing and considered arguments of counsel, as well as pertinent case law, the court now grants defendant's motion for the reasons set below. So he is granting his motion for immunity based on self-defense. The facts as they are understood by Judge McBurney. On 15 May, 2021, Christopher Swain hosted a large and long party at his home on South Elizabeth Place in Atlanta. Most attendees and their host were connected by way of their membership to the Omega Psi Phi fraternity. One of Swain's invitees was defendant, a close friend for many years, and the man who had pledged Swain into the Phi Kappa Kappa chapter of the Omega Psi Phi. Whew. Another later arriving guest was Kendrick Cooper, a younger Omega who belonged to the tri -Mu chapter. Cooper was in fact staying at Swain's house that weekend, having flown into town from Dallas to catch up with friends. When Cooper appeared at the party, he enthusiastically sought to have all the Neos, freshly minted Omegas from the Phi Kappa Kappa chapter, line up for him and get good with him. Defendant, who did not know Cooper, viewed this as potentially disruptive and not appropriate for a family gathering. Cooper, on the other hand, insisted he was merely trying to get to know the new young men and meant no harm. Defendant, who is part of the founding or charter line of the Phi Kappa Kappa chapter, took Cooper aside and admonished him not to start anything at a party like this. The exchange did not go well for either participant. While only words were exchanged, it was plain that neither was particularly impressed with the other. Defendant felt Cooper was a rambunctious troublemaker, and Cooper found defendant to be meddlesome, disrespectful, and self-important. Things did not improve as the evening wore on. According to defendant, Cooper remained loudly upset about their initial encounter. At the urging of the party's DJ, defendant later approached Cooper in peacemaker mode, offering to get Cooper a drink in an effort to squash the beef. I love that he's reciting the terminology exactly how it was explained to him. If you remember, he asked for clarification exactly on what do you mean by squash the beef? Defendant says Cooper responded aggressively and knocked defendant's own drink out of his hand and into his face. The pair then began to grapple and other partygoers had to separate the two. During the tussle, defendant claims Cooper told him that he was a Marine and could kill him with his bare hands. Cooper denied ever saying such a thing, although he twice demonstrated that evening the truth of the alleged statement. Cooper's rendition of the peace summit was quite different. He claims he was a pro peace summit. Gosh, I love McBurney. He claims he was approached by his pro fight, a mentor of sorts from his Omega chapter and several other Omegas and was asked to step away from the festivities to make things right with the defendant. This annoyed Cooper as he did not feel anything needed to be set right, but he dutifully complied with his pro fight's request. Per Cooper, the conversation quickly degraded as defendant swore at him and then tossed a drink on him. This prompted Cooper, a competitive mixed martial arts fighter, to lunge at the defendant. 
The pair tumbled to the ground and Cooper quickly placed defendant in a cradle, something Cooper describes as a jujitsu hold designed to incapacitate an assailant. This cradle involved no small amount of pressure to defendant's throat and defendant quickly went limp, after which Cooper released him and walked away. So much for the peace summit. <laughs> Later that night, or earlier, depending on the witness, Cooper got in another fight and applied another chokehold, this time to an Omega named Bruce, whose sin was to look at Cooper the wrong way, as Cooper changed clothes in the middle of Swain's living room. Ooh, eyes up. When Bruce alleged, allegedly took up an offensive fighting stance against Cooper, Cooper, the mixed martial arts warrior, threw Bruce down and got him into the infamous cradle until Bruce submitted. While defendant did not see this other takedown choke out, he did hear from others about it well before the final fateful encounter with Cooper. At the end of the evening, Swain was with defendant trying to get him to leave while Cooper's friends were with him trying to get him to his next event. Everyone seemed interested in keeping defendant and Cooper apart. Defendant was standing by his vehicle, transferring his pistol, which he always kept locked in his Mercedes SUV, and other belongings from the rear of his car to the front. But note one, Swain alone testified that defendant had been searching for his gun for hours, hoping to be able to confront Cooper with it. Oh, that claim is not supported by any other testimony and is inconsistent with defendant's custom and practice of secreting his firearm in the rear of his vehicle while attending social events. Cooper was up the street and, depending on the version of events provided during the immunity hearing, either saw defendant before he got in another car or saw defendant from within that car and got out. Either way, it is, un it is uncontroverted that Cooper spied defendant and raced towards him. Some witnesses testified that he approached yelling he was going to kill the defendant. Others said he just ran up. Defendant insisted Cooper rushed him with one hand behind his back. Most others, including Cooper, said he was running normally, if perhaps a bit drunkenly, and had nothing in his hands. Critically, no one described the approach as peaceful, friendly, or welcomed by anyone. The person who clearly welcomed it the least was defendant, who told Cooper to stop. When Cooper did not, Defendant raised the pistol and fired once. The bullet hit and passed through Cooper and somehow, as wayward bullets often tragically do, ricocheted into Swain. One shot, two victims. Tellingly, once he saw that Cooper was no longer menacing him, defendant put away his gun and turned to render aid to Swain. He drove Swain to Grady Hospital while others drove Cooper there. Defendant remained on scene and spoke freely with law enforcement about the situation. The police also interviewed several other eyewitnesses. While their stories differed in many details and varied in yet other ways when they were testified at the immunity hearing, the most credible and consistent version of events that emerges from consideration of all the evidence, eyewitness testimony, body cam video, etc., is the following. It's got to be hard getting credible testimony from a bunch of drunk people who don't remember once they sober up. Cooper was initially verbally aggressive with defendant after defendant confronted him about lining up the neos. According to Cooper, the alleged victim in the state's case, his next encounter with defendant ended with Cooper converting those aggressive words into violent actions by taking defendant to the ground and placing him in a cradle chokehold. Curiously, defendant did not share this version of events at the hearing. The closest he came was to assert that during the failed effort to defuse the conflict, Cooper swung at him and knocked his drink in his face. Given that Cooper had every reason not to embellish his image as the aggressor in the situation, the court resolves that the conflict in testimony by finding that pride came before candor and that defendant declined to acknowledge that Cooper so easily got the better of him. In other words, he got your ass handed to you, <laughs> but didn't want to admit that in court. Yeah, makes sense. At another point in the evening, Cooper cradled another Omega, Bruce of the why are you looking at me that way infamy <laughs> incident. Maybe we need that on a t-shirt. Bruce, why are you looking at me that way? <laughs> of which defendant was aware when Cooper rushed him on the street outside Swain's home. Finally, as the party was wrapping up, Cooper unprovoked raced towards defendant, having broken free from at least one, if not two, scrums of men trying to keep him back. Cooper had no weapon in his hands as he rushed defendant, but his hands were plainly and demonstrably deadly weapons. The law. Defendant seeks immunity from prosecution pursuant to OCGA 16.321 and 16.324.2. Georgia's immunity statute bars criminal proceedings against persons if they, are, if they present sufficient evidence at a pretrial hearing to persuade the trial court that they were acting in self-defense, according to Hip v. State. 
a defendant seeking immunity bears the burden of showing by a preponderance of the evidence that he is entitled to immunity, that is, that he legitimately acted in self-defense, Hughes v. State. Defendant has met this burden, that burden. A person is justified in using force against another only if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to defend himself against the other's imminent use of unlawful force, OCGA 321A. And to be justified in using deadly force, a defendant, as defendant did here, the person must reasonably believe that such force is necessary to prevent the death or great bodily injury to himself or others. Here, the court finds that it was reasonable for defendant to believe that he was at risk for great bodily injury, if not worse, and so his use of deadly force against Kendrick Cooper was justified. While the evidence is muddled as to whether Cooper was issuing verbal threats of death or harm as he ran down the street towards the defendant, what is clear is that the defendant was not advancing on Cooper, but was merely standing by his car when Cooper, who by his own admission had only a few hours prior taken defendant to the ground and nearly choked him to unconsciousness. I think he admitted on the record that he did choke him unconscious because he said when he went limp, he let go of him. I can't imagine him going limp without being unconscious, but that's just my two cents. And later did the same thing to another party goer, a second violent episode about which defendant knew, aggressively approached him. The nature, indeed, the very fact of the tumultuous approach was that threat, regardless of what words were spoken or yelled. And a threat of great bodily injury is sufficient to justify the use of deadly force. Footnote three, the state's argument against immunity relied in part on the notion that verbal threats and fisticuffs, I love that word, do not justify the use of deadly force. And that's Collier v. State, citing Felder v. State and Lewis v. State. Fisticuffs means simply fighting with fists. That is decidedly not what Cooper did to defend it when he took him to the ground and cradled him in this dangerous jujitsu hold. Cooper freely acknowledged that the cradle could be deadly if he let it, right? He had control of that and we trust his judgment. Thus defendant was not defending against mere words and the threat of a punch to the face when he, was, when he raised his gun and fired the lone shot to prevent another chokehold or worse. Oh, where was that footnote? Okay. Indeed, the evidence here adequately supports the conclusion that defendant reasonably believed that he needed to defend himself from a violent attack from Cooper and could have caused him great bodily injury. Defendant brought a gun to a property where he knew everyone, including he, would be drinking freely. A footnote four, the police body cam footage revealed visi several visibly intoxicated men, including the defendant. While the wisdom of such a decision is questionable, yeah, there was nothing illegal about his choice and he was acting within the bounds of the self-defense laws that our legislature has duly passed when he used the gun to rep repeal what he reasonably believed to be another potentially deadly assault from Kendrick Cooper. His motion for immunity is granted, footnote five. Given this finding, the state is similarly barred from prosecuting the second aggravated assault charge involving defendant's former, whew, close friend and host, Christopher Swain. Bernie's got jokes. Under the principle of transferred jurisdiction, no guilt attaches if an accused is justified in shooting to repel, repeal an assault, but misses and hits an innocent bystander, Howard v. State, disapproved of on other grounds by Johnson v. State. Here, the defendant did not miss, but as mentioned, his bullet after passing through Cooper also struck Swain. Because this order precludes the state from proceeding on any counts of the indictment, the clerk shall mark this case as closed. So ordered this 18th day of May, 2023, Judge Robert C.I. McBurney. Now I need to know what that C.I. stands for. Hmm. So all charges dropped. Have a nice life. One of the problems is at this point, we are two years following the incident before this specific motion even was heard. And the defendant has lost his position as athletic director and director of football operations at Morehouse College. He's also taken a significant hit to his reputation as lots of rumors and other negative chatter has been passed around about him over the prior two years. And they all went on their merry way and everybody lived happily ever after, right? Yeah. No, Mr. Cooper was not satisfied with 
the charges being dropped, and he went after Mr. Thomas civilly. He also went after Mr. Thomas's employer, which is interesting, as well as John Doe's 1 in 10 and ABC Companies 1 through 10, which are basically placeholders for people to be added in the future. In the civil complaint, a lot of the same facts are recited. The addition is that Defendant Morehouse College was and now is a private college. At all times mentioned in this complaint, Defendant Thomas was employed by Defendant Morehouse College, Inc. and was acting within the scope and course of said employment while at the frat party. On or about May 15th, 2021, plaintiff was inside a residence near the campus of Morehouse College for a social gathering. Defendant Thomas and other individuals related to Morehouse College were also present at that social gathering. Defendant Thomas was in attendance both as an individual and as the athletic director of Morehouse College's football program. At some point during the night, there was an altercation between Defendant Thomas and the plaintiff that was diffused by others in attendance. After the two gentlemen separated, people started to disperse from inside the home. Plaintiff proceeded to walk outside, enter a vehicle, waiting outside. An eyewitness overheard Defendant Thomas say that he was going to shoot the plaintiff, Kendrick Cooper. I don't remember hearing that being testified to. Defendant Thomas went to his vehicle and returned with a firearm. Returned. And he came back from somewhere despite the fact that he shot from the doorway of his vehicle, I believe. Although plaintiff was unarmed at all times relevant to the incident, defendant Thomas raised his arm, took aim at the plaintiff, and discharged the firearm with the intent to maim or kill the plaintiff. The bullet struck plaintiff in the midriff and entered his lower abdomen. The bullet then exited his body and struck another man nearby. That was Swain. Defendant Thomas did not attempt to provide or request medical assistance for the plaintiff. It's so funny. He testified to things totally different than this in the criminal case, but they're, they're not connected at all. He testified that people were on him immediately, helping him, and Thomas helped Swain right away. Plaintiff was rushed to Grady Hospital for emergency treatment. Because of these injuries, plaintiff was required to be hospitalized and undergo medical care and treatment, including surgery. Patient was partially disabled for a period of time and unable to work and participate in normal activities. Plaintiff continues to suffer from mental and physical pain as a result of the injuries. Plaintiff incurred medical expenses, lost wages, and continues to suffer mental anguish as a result of the plaintiff's injuries. Now, count one, negligence and negligence per se of the defendant Thomas. Plaintiffs reincorporate and reallege paragraphs one through 19 in this complaint as fully set forth herein in their entirety. At the time and place, defendant Thomas failed to act in a manner expected of a reasonable and prudent person when he attempted to shoot the plaintiff. As a direct and proximate result of that unlawful discharge of Defendant Thomas's firearm, plaintiff sustained severe injuries. Defendant Thomas's negligent actions were the sole direct and proximate cause of the injury. Plaintiff's injuries were not the result of any negligence on the part of the plaintiff or any other person other than Defendant Thomas. As a direct and proximate cause of Defendant Thomas's negligence, plaintiff incurred significant past, present, future physical and mental pain and suffering, as well as extensive special, special damages all of which will be itemized by an appropriate amendment to these pleadings. Defendant Thomas is therefore liable to plaintiff for special and general damages in the amount to be proven by evidence at trial. Count two, vicarious liability of Morehouse College, Inc. Plaintiff realleges paragraphs one through 26. Upon information and belief, Defendant Thomas at all times material herein too was an actual and or apparent and or a sustainable agent of Defendant Morehouse College and was acting with express permission and consent of Morehouse College at all times during which he was attending the social gathering on May 15, 2021. Pursuant to actual apparent and or sustainable agency, Defendant Morehouse College is liable to plaintiff for any and all damages attributable to the negligent acts and or omissions of its actual apparent or sustainable agents who negligently or intentionally caused tortious, 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 blah, injury to plaintiff at all times material here into as a result of the incident. I, I don't understand how he was acting in an official capacity when he was at an after hours party just because there were people from that he supervises there. I don't know. Count three assault, plaintiff realleges paragraphs one through 29. Defendant Thomas intended to cause and did cause plaintiffs to suffer apprehension of an immediate harmful contact. Defendant Thomas assaulted plaintiff by showing that he both intended and had the ability to enter plaintiff prior to and during the time of the incident between plaintiff and defendant by brandishing his firearm. Plaintiff was at all relevant times in this incident aware of defendant Thomas's actions, intentions, and ability to injure plaintiff. 
Even though plaintiff was unarmed, defendant Thomas continued to taunt, heckle, and threaten plaintiff and eventually shot him. Wow. Count four, battery. Plaintiff realleges, paragraphs one through 34. Defendant Thomas battered plaintiff when he intentionally shot and willfully injured plaintiff. He intended to cause and did cause harmful contact with plaintiff's person. Plaintiff did not consent to defendant Thomas's acts. Hmm. As a result of def defendant Thomas's negligence and intentional acts, plaintiff sustained severe internal and external injuries resulting from being shot by defendant Thomas. The exact injuries and diagnosis shall be shown at trial. The injuries have caused plaintiff to suffer medical damage in excess of $442,507 and three cents. Don't forget those three pennies. The exact total of which shall be proven at trial. Didn't he have insurance? Wasn't he a pilot or something in the military? That can't be after insurance. The plaintiff realleges paragraphs one through 40 above as they were set forth herein verbatim. Defendant Thomas intentionally threatened, shot, and willfully injured the plaintiff over a verbal dispute that had ended before the attack. Defendant Thomas's conduct towards plaintiff was malicious, willful, and wanton and caused emotional distress to the plaintiff, whether he actually intended to cause the distress or not. Defendant Thomas's assault and battery of the plaintiff was meant to inflict extreme and outrageous emotional distress, or at a minimum, Defendant Thomas's reckless and willful disregard for the consequences of his actions and his knowledge that said actions would likely cause such significant emotional distress. As a direct and proximate cause of Defendant Thomas's conduct, plaintiff suffered extreme emotional distress, punitive damages, realleged paragraph one through 45. His behavior demonstrated by clear and convincing evidence that Defendant Thomas's actions showed willful misconduct, malice, fraud, wantonness, oppression, and the entire want for care, which would rise from the resumption of consciousness, indifference of consequences. This is like boilerplate cut and paste. Like, anyways, further, the behavior of Defendant Thomas demonstrates that Defendant Thomas acted with the specific intent to cause harm, such as there is no limitation regarding the amount which may be awarded as punitive damages against defendants. Lost wages. Paragraphs realleged, in addition to his medical expenses, plaintiff is making a claim for lost wages for all of the time that he has been unable to work as a result of his injuries he sustained in the above referenced incident, the exact amount of which shall be proven at trial. As a further direct and proximate cause of defendant's conduct, plaintiff is unable to work for a period of time and suffered harm to his reputation in the business community, which has caused him to lose work and income. These amounts of damages will be proven at trial. Attorney's fees... And prayer. Plaintiff prays that he is awarded a judgment against defendants as follows. The summons issue and service be perfected upon defendants, requiring them to appear before this court and answer this complaint for damages. Two, general damages in the amount to be determined by the enlightened conscious, conscious of a impartial jury for punitive damage and in the amount to be determined by an enlightened conscious of an, oh, that's punitive. Special damages proven by evidence at trial, the cost and expenses for this litigation, any and all future relief that this court deems just and proper under the circumstances, and for a trial by jury on the issues that are so triable. Matthew Jones, Georgia State Bar. That was fun. The initial civil complaint in this matter was filed in May of 2023. A month later, within his 30 days, 20 days, I'm sure, to answer... Mr. Thomas filed his answer to the plaintiff's complaint for damages and defendant's counterclaim for damages. So he is filing a counterclaim. That's interesting. I wonder what for. So his first affirmative defense is basically that he was justified in his shooting based on the findings of the criminal case, OCGA 16-324 self-defense, and he had no duty to retreat. His statement of fact is that on May 15th, 2021, he was invited to attend a large social event hosted by Christopher Swain at his home on South Elizabeth's Place in Atlanta, Georgia. And one of the invited guests at the party was the plaintiff, Kendrick Cooper. The plaintiff was extremely boisterous at the party. In fact, the plaintiff knocked a drink out of the defendant's hand, put multiple guests in deathly chokehold, and attacked the defendant while he was at his vehicle. Despite warning the plaintiff to stop, the plaintiff continued to attack the defendant, which then caused the defendant to defend himself. Defendant was granted immunity by Judge Robert McBurney of the Fulton County Superior Court. So the defendant admits the allegations that were set forth in paragraphs one, two, and three, has no knowledge of four, five. Uh, responding to paragraph six, he denies the allegations set forth in the complaint and asserts that he was acting in his personal capacity. So that must be the one about Morehouse College. He has no knowledge of the others. He specifically denies having any, attending the party in any capacity. 
of his job as the assistant athletic director. Like, that was just ridiculous. He also denies that he returned to the gathering with a firearm. Okay, all the rest is what you would expect. He's denying all the allegations and everything kind of falls in line with a self-defense. Defendant denies the claim set forth in paragraph 51. Defendant Thomas asserts that plaintiff has maintained jobs as both an MMA instructor and an airline pilot, and that these facts were admitted under oath. Interestingly. In response to the events above, defendant counterclaimant Thomas seeks damages for injuries suffered as a result of Cooper's assault. Mr. Cooper intended to cause and did cause Mr. Thomas to suffer apprehension of an immediate harmful contact. Mr. Cooper assaulted Mr. Thomas by showing that he both intended and had the ability to injure Mr. Thomas. As a result of Mr. Cooper's actions, Mr. Thomas sustained damages in the form of lost wages, as well as physical and mental pain and suffering. Defendant demands a jury trial. He says that as a result of Mr. Cooper's actions, Mr. Thomas sustained injuries whose exact nature will be demonstrated at trial. He must mean um, emotional and financial injuries because I don't remember seeing anything about him being injured physically. Mr. Cooper intentionally threatened, attacked, and willfully injured Mr. Thomas. Mr. Cooper's conduct towards Mr. Thomas was intentional, willful, malicious, and wanton, causing emotional distress. Mr. Cooper's conduct consisting of assault and battery was meant to inflict extreme and significant emotional distress. Alternatively, Mr. Cooper's reckless and willful disregard for the consequences of his actions and his knowledge that his actions would likely cause significant emotional distress inflicted severe emotional I think that's supposed to be severe, sever, emotional trauma on Mr. Thomas. As a direct and proximate cause of Mr. Cooper's action, Mr. Thomas has suffered extreme emotional distress. Defendant demands a jury trial. Because of Mr. Cooper's actions, Mr. Thomas lost his position as athletic director at Morehouse College. That's a big one. According to Mr. Thomas, assert herein a claim for lost wages for the time that he had been unable to work as a result of the lengthy legal action that followed the above referenced incident. The exact amount of lost wages will be proven at trial. It was two years from start to finish, I believe. As a direct consequence, Mr. Cooper's action, Mr. Thomas has been unable to work since the incident and has suffered harm to his reputation in the community at large. The defendant requests a jury trial. And his prayer for relief is that the complaint is dismissed, that his counterclaim for damages is granted, a jury trial on defendant's counterclaim, a hearing on defendant's motion to dismiss, attorney's fees, and all other the relief the court deems proper and just. Respectfully submitted this 14th day of June, 2023, Jeremy Abernathy, attorney for Philip Thomas. There were quite a few motions filed back and forth uh, related to Morehouse College's involvement. Hi, Penny, do you want to assist in this? Matter, there's no view for you. Nobody can see you. They can just hear you licking. Um, one of which was incredibly lengthy, and I don't believe it's necessary to pay $30 to look at it because it all says the same thing. He was not acting in his official capacity. So the last motion, the answer was filed on June of 2023. So fast forward to April of 2024, and the order for Morehouse College's motion for summary judgment was granted. It says, whereas, wherefore, defendant Morehouse College, Inc. is entitled to summary judgment in its favor, as the record reflects that, one, no genuine issue of material fact ex exists as to the plaintiff's vicarious liability claim against defendant Morehouse College, and two, the central issue of whether defendant Philip Thomas acted with a justified use of force in self-defense pursuant to OCGA 16.321 in the act of shooting plaintiff Kendrick Cooper and would therefore be entitled to statutory immunity from liability was already litigated and adjudicated on the merits by a court of competent jurisdiction in a prior action, which was the Superior Court of Fulton County, the case we just watched. And the plaintiff is precluded from relitigating the essential issue in the instant case due to the doctrine of collateral estoppel. Collateral estoppel is also known as preclusion, and it is the legal doctrine that prevents parties from relitigating an issue that was already decided in a previous lawsuit. In Georgia, it requires that these same parties be involved in both lawsuits, which is known as identity of parties, and the issue must have already been decided. And this can cross over between civil and criminal because it is the exact same issue. The court, having considered defendant's motion in support of the thereof and the supporting evidence of record, the court finds the defendant Morehouse College Inc. is entitled to summary judgment. As a matter of law, defendant Morehouse College motion is granted. The court hereby dismisses plaintiff's claims against Morehouse College with prejudice. 
for those of you who get easily confused like me, with prejudice means it is closed, done, the end, move on with your life. You can't bring it again. We're not, we're not doing this again. We're done. Move it along. Find another one. Without prejudice means you're free to retry this issue once you correct whatever it was that resulted in this one being dismissed. A month later on May 24th, 2024, a voluntary dismissal without prejudice was filed by Mr. Kendrick Cooper, voluntarily dismissing the above referenced action. Each party was to bear their own costs and fees related to litigating this matter. I don't know whether they settled out of court or they just got sick of it and moved on with their life because there's a lot of things going on that's more important than this because they were both equally dumbasses in this whole thing, in my opinion. If you want to see more of the fabulous Judge McBurney, who always has me rolling, he has his own playlist, and um, I've covered quite a few videos of him. The Fly Lawyer even makes a cameo in one of them. As always, I appreciate your support. Please make sure you hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. If you do hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit that bell, because if you don't hit that bell, you're not going to get all the notifications. You got to hit it and make it fill in the colors, not just the outline. I have the colors. And even then, you might not get them. So maybe you need to go over to one of the socials and follow me. So when I remember, I will post videos as they drop. You can find the links to the socials in my handy dandy link tree, which I figured out. Woohoo, go me. And I will see you all soon. Mm -hmm.